So shall we get started today? Is everybody ready for this? I am really excited today to have Taya Gigo, Kim Silvagi, and Carolyn Nicolay talking about their specialties. Each of them is focused on a, a, a really interesting and important aspect of pigment work. And I think that what they have to contribute to our knowledge base is extremely important and huge. So I'm gonna, I would, could everybody please mute themselves so that we don't have any background interference? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to dive in. Today we're going to do a couple of different things. We're going to do the um, the happy hour with Kim, Taya, and Caroline. And then we will have a very special viewing of Catalina Christensen's video, a virtual field trip to Elkhorn Nellison's. Um, that I'm really looking forward to. I've seen it and it is just magic. It is so fun and interesting. And Lucy Mayes helped Catalina put it together. And I think that everybody's going to love it. And we will have a segment after that where you can all sh do show and tell with some uh, either a favorite image that relates to pigments or an object that relates to pigments. Um, you know, whatever you would like to share, as long as it relates to pigments. <laughs> so I'm going to begin by introducing Kim Salvagi. Salvagi, sorry, Kim. She is a, a conservator in residence at the Slade School of Fine Art in London. And she was trained officially in conservation at the Institute of Archaeology, University College of London. Um, but she has been working on, her current research is working on the fugitive pigments that Van Gogh and other artists of that period used to figure out what, what those pigments actually are, why they're fugitive, and why the artists, even when they knew they were fugitive, still used them. And I think one of the things that I find fascinating about Kim's work is she has to get inside the artist's head to understand why they would use something that they knew would not last. So then we have um, Taya Gigo. Taya is a heritage scientist, which is something that a, a term I'd never heard before but I think is going to become incredibly important in the pigment world. Her research is focused on uh, the materiality. Of the um, if everybody could please mute, thank you. Um, she, she is studying the materiality of pigments found in manuscripts and paintings from different time periods. And I think that her work really is going to help define uh, the importance of materials in the past and, and how they influenced how they were used and why they were used. And then Caroline, who I think might have the most fun job of anybody I've ever heard of, is an experiential archaeologist. She is a trained archaeologist, but her day job and probably her, you know, rest of her life is taken up by this. She does, um, she recreates the past. Her research is focused on the Iron Age and the fact that the Iron Age was not just all dull and gray. I, I can't remember what she called it, 50 shades of brown. It's not just Fifty Shades of Brown, that these people used and loved color as much as 
anybody else, it, it, you know, throughout history. But we have so little information about this period. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. Kim is going to lead off with the first question. She, the, the speakers will introduce themselves and then they will um, field questions to each other. And when a speaker has finished answering a question, we're going to throw it out to you guys too. If you would like to comment or, you know, if you have any information on the subject, we would love to know about it. So with that, Here's Kim Salvaggi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Melanie. Um, and thanks for coordinating this. This is a really great event to have and a really great community to start. Um, so a lot of the work that I've been involved in lately has really been um, a, about lake pigments, um, actually. And so um, specifically looking at the degradation of Eosin lakes. Um, and so Van Gogh was an avid user of Eosin as it was brightly colored and it fit well um, among his palette. And so you don't know what Eosin is. It was, um, it was a synthetic dye manufactured around 1860, 1870, um, and then made into a lake better known as geranium lake uh, with the addition of red lead. And so many of Van Gogh's works are notorious for fading over time. Um, and researchers have attributed the loss to many of his red shades to be from the degradation of this pigment um, eosin. And so I did a number of accelerated aging tests um, on my own reconstructed eosin and geranium lake paints to assess how they deteriorated. And then I used those paints in a copy um, of Van Gogh's roses uh, to see if I could get a glimpse of, of what Van Gogh may have originally portrayed, um, which would have been pink roses. And today we see them as white uh, since all the red pigment has since deteriorated. Um, but so my first question is for Taya, and I'll ask, uh, you know, what relationship has there been through throughout history between pigments used as writing materials and pigments used as painting materials? Because I need to learn more about how they've been used as, um, as writing materials. Thank you, Kim, for your question. Uh, so first, a little bit about myself. Um, Melanie did a pretty good job to introduce me already. So I am a heritage scientist, which means that my job involves the use of science daily. And in particular, I use several analytical techniques to determine the uh, material composition of pigments. I worked both on pigments using paintings and on pigments used in manuscripts, particularly Egyptian manuscripts. Uh, and what I really love about what I do is the fact that uh, being linked to a certain material rather than to a certain period, I get to see how materials evolve throughout history and how they are used and how they change. So um, <laughs> it's a very nice question you're asking, Kim. Um, uh, if we go back in history uh, to the dawn of time, uh, we would find mainly one type of ink, really, which is carbon ink being used, I would say, everywhere uh, in antiquity. Um, carbon ink is a type of ink obtained by burning anything, really, like pine wood or any kind of wood, but also resin. So you Chocolate. burn it down, you get suit, you get charcoal and you can mix it with a binder, normally gamma rubic, but also animal glue, and you obtain your ink. And back then, the same kind of 
material, carbon, that was used for writing was also used for painting. Uh, and I'm going to stop here because I think that Caroline is much better suited to explain you everything about ancient uses of pigments. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead in time to tell you that at a certain point, um, and particularly during the 19th century, with the uh, Industrial Revolution, we start seeing a sort of a diversification in what's used for writing and what's used for painting. So at that point, we've got carbon ink, we've got iron gold ink that had been used during the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance period. And at some point in the 19th century, something changes with the, um, with the production of the first synthetic dyes we've got dyes, certain dyes that are used in writing and in manuscripts and different dyes that are used instead for paintings. And so that's when you can observe the big change. So I would say in general, um, painting materials and writing materials, they've been made by using very similar substances, very similar pigments up to the 19th century when everything changes suddenly. At least this is my understanding of the topic, but I'd be happy to hear more input if anyone from the public has any. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I kept pushing the I kept pushing the little microphone. That's that's really interesting, Taya. I hadn't even thought about Actually, I hadn't thought about any diversi diversification between, um, you know, the types of pigments and, and materials used for inks as opposed to, you know, in the past, as opposed to, you know, the last couple hundred years. Um, do you want to, do you want to take the next question? I can, I can ask the next question. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this is one for Caroline. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about so why the Iron Age is not 50 shades of brown? What evidence do we have that it was actually more colorful than we tend to think? Right, thanks for the question. Um, so hello, everyone. I'll just explain a little bit more about myself. Uh, again, thanks, Melanie, for <laughs> explaining already and for bringing us all together. Um, so I am trained as an archaeologist, but I always worked in public interpretation, so, or collections, instead of being on a dig in a field, working more in museums and sharing every bit of knowledge that we have uh, with the public. Doesn't matter what their age is, where they come from, what understanding or knowledge they already have about the topic, the idea is to adapt the language and how you transmit it for everybody to understand and everybody to enjoy themselves and remember it. That's, that's the base of it. To do that, uh, as Melanie said, I work mainly with living history um, and experiential archaeology, which is uh, the same thing, but then difference is between history and archaeology. So my job is to do a lot of research and try to understand everything in details, most up to date possible, and then recreate items, recreate clothing, recreate many crafts or other things to present archaeology, history, or the past in general in a very understandable, appealing, enjoyable way to anybody. And my focus at the moment is Iron Age wall paintings out of anything. So I work mainly on natural pigments between the Stone Age and the beginning of the Roman time, if you like. If you have any specific questions about that, let me know later on. <laughs> but I won't dive into the separation between historical periods. Um, so in terms of why it's not, or the Iron Age is not 50, <laughs> 50 shades of brown, what I usually tell children, um, it's that. It, it is the vision that we have of the past. We all, or many of us, heard about cave art, cave paintings, 
really the Stone Age. Then we hear a lot about Roman frescoes, but nothing else in between. And it's thousands and thousands of years where people lived and unfortunately didn't write much about what they were doing. They were still painting, creating paints, creating brushes, doing some art, painting their houses or some items, but it's not very often mentioned, either at school, in museums or anywhere else. Um, and that's what bugs me. It's, it's really that. It's what is misunderstood, not shown enough, and makes us think about the distant past in a very um, barbarian rolling in the grass all the time, chewing on twigs and wearing deer skins to protect themselves from the cold. It's very far away from the truth. And thanks to archaeology, mainly, we now know that at least in northern northern France, northeastern France, Germany, a bit in Belgium, then Bulgaria, and you might have heard about uh, Chatel Hoyuk in Turkey, so it's much out of my comfort zone, geographically speaking, we have evidence of wall paintings. Unfortunately for Iron Age people, the house usually has to burn down, so it cooks the wattle and door walls, and door being made quite often with clay, majority of the time, the heat from the fire bakes these walls and let us know if there were any traces of paints or renders and so on and so forth on the walls. Very unfortunately, as you might already know, um, and there's a very good example of that in Pompeii, when there's a lot of heat, many of the pigments that are iron-based turn red. So when we, in archaeology, find traces of pigments, it's usually red because it just turned into a red, or it might disappear, it might turn black. So there's a difference in uh, evolution of the pigment there. Some of that research has been done mainly uh, around Germany. I don't read German, <laughs> so I'm really grateful to anybody who has translated that to French. At least I can take the French articles and translate them into English. So it's a, <laughs> it's a complicated research. But at least it's very, it's very nice to work within many different European countries. Otherwise, we have traces of paints on objects that haven't burned, which is great. The annoying thing is, it still is red. For example, in Britain, the only item painted that I know of for the Iron Age is an Iron Age shield. Uh, it has been found in 2014 in Leicestershire, and it, it changed everything we thought we knew about all of these paints and also shields in the Iron Age. It's made of tree bark, uh, reinforced with a few branches of hazel all around, and it's painted just with squares of hematite red. But they are mentioned in the report that are not that clear. So it might be hematite red or it might be red ochre. It seems to be hematite, but I just stopped there. There are some objects, Iron Age objects, painted as well. Bronze Age uh, kist, so a type of stone line graves um, in Germany that have been found. There are some Mesolithic, some Middle Stone Age paddles that are carved, so engraved and painted or color rubbed into that from Denmark as well. These are mainly the, the items I work on. For the rest, you then end up with the Roman periods where they very fortunately write pretty much everything down. And, um, and they have quite a lot of at least fresco paintings, uh, remains. Lots of frescoes, lots of tempera paints. So that is a completely different brain where there's much more evidence and less questioning. So I hope that answered it a little bit. So I might just carry on and straight away jump into asking questions. <laughs> Yeah, and go I ahead. have one for go ahead. Uh, Kim, as long as I find it. Here we go. It's very simple, but I work mainly on earth pigments. So, Kim, could you could you explain what is a lake pigment and how they are made and how you make yours? Sure, yeah. <laughs> so, the term lake refers to the method of manufacture. For that, for that pigment. So the term lake pigment 
refers to a pigment that has been made by precipitating a dye um, or dispersing the dye in water and combining it with um, various metallic salts like alum or um, aluminum potassium sulfate, which is the most popular. Um, in, in general, the lake pigment um, is formed by the reaction between the alum and the addition of an alkali like sodium carbonate to um, the dye stuff solution. And so this combination of the colorant and a substrate renders an insoluble pigment uh, that can then be ground with a binding medium to make paint. Although it's not always so straightforward, um, the process for creating a lake pigment is somewhat unique to each dye and each substrate being used. Um, so certain colors require specific uh, extraction methods. And additionally, the alum to alkali ratio varies depending on the dye. Um, so some trial and error is, is required to acquire the proper quantities for, for a particular dye source. Um, but in general, um, a, good, a good place to start, um, I generally start out when I'm testing a dye I have no idea about um, with a half a teaspoon of dye to the water. Um, and like, cause typically if I'm making like um, Brazil wood or, um, you know, weld or, or anything that's kind of already in a powdered form, like a dry powdered dye, you can take about a half a teaspoon of that and add it to, um, how much do I do? Typically, I think it's about a hundred milliliters of water. Um, of hot of hot deionized water too. I don't I don't use tap. Um, and then and then adding usually about a 10 percent solution of alum again that's been dissolved in hot deionized water um, and adding that to the dye jar. Um, and then in another jar you make about a two and a, a two and a half percent solution um, of your alkali. Um, again in, in hot deionized water, and then you add that to your dye solution and that will immediately start fizzing. Um, and that's, that's the base reacting with the acid and that's essentially the solution allowing the pigment to bind to the colorant. And so that's typically my method. Um, generally, you know, it, it takes a couple times to, to figure out the exact ratio of, of how much is needed for, for each one, but it's a fun process to get into. Um, yes. So you said that you used hot deionized water. Why? Why not tap water? Why not uh, purified water? Why deionized? I typically just go for deionized because it's what I've been trained with in, in the laboratory setting. Um, purified water, distilled water would be completely fine. I chose deionized to limit the amount of contaminants that I was introducing to my pigment. So in the, so in a home practice in, in somebody's art practice, the, you're looking at, you're doing the scientific analysis of these. So in the home practice, it's not as critical, you know, what type of water. Yeah, if you were, it depends on what your practice is. So for mine, it was, I was specifically testing, you know, the, the eosin pigment and I wanted it to be um, as pure as possible, 
to test its actual properties um, so that there so that I, I knew what I was testing was uh, authentic eosin and there had been no contaminants with it to try to um, you know manipulate the the data that I got um, so that was the only reason depend if if it's you know your own practice and you're you're casually just exploring things it's not it's not going to matter what what kind of water you use okay thanks for clarifying that <laughs> <laughs> i would have been hunting for deionized water somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry that's just my training um Always no, but it's good. It's good for us to know too that that's part of the process for testing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in testing, you want to limit the amount of other variables that can happen to your, yeah. to your samples, right? So, I wanted very minimal contam uh, contaminants in my samples. So I used all of the most pure ingredients that that I could use when I when I made the paint up. And, and for people like me, I actually like the, the randomness that not having things that, uh, that pure, the, the results can always, you know, surprise you. And that's part of the fun of, of working with natural materials for me is seeing what they're going to do, you know, rather well, than me trying to keep them in a tight little structure. Well, exactly. And so even with lakes too, you can often get a different color with, with the different materials as well. So uh, yeah, depending on the metallic salt that you use as well, you can, you can obtain a completely different color. And similarly, you know, how long you, you um, extract the dye for, or, you know, let it, let it steep in its dye bath. Uh, your colors will will differ from time to time that you make it. So it's difficult to obtain the same color every single time. So it really does become a an exact science at some point if you want to make mm -hmm. the exact same color. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask your next question? Yeah. So I will ask Caroline, uh, what... What were the uh, tools that people were using in the Iron Age to to paint or um, to make paints? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have we don't have many finds, but going back to everything mixed with Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, um, everything that's non-written, there's a lot of grinding stones mainly because they survive in archaeology. Um, so we find a fair few of them. And there's some actually from the Iron Age that just popped up in a, in a UK um, archaeological report. So I need to inquire about that and dig a bit more. So you have grinding stones. You can see some uh, very nice stone pallets as well, um, especially from the caves, Lascaux Cave, for example, in France and so on and so forth. We find um, bits, but pieces, sometimes crayons, ochre crayons. Um, I would refer to, to Tammy on that, because <laughs> we find them very rarely, again, in under our latitudes in archaeology. Um, what I quite like and would like to explore more are the traces left, left by different paintbrushes on either walls or pottery. There's a lot of Iron Age, the so Middle Iron Age, Early Iron Age, say eight to 500 BC, um, painted pots that are very complex designs uh, in Champagne in France. And you find on some of them, some traces that can only be left by paintbrushes that have three points, three to six points. I know it still exists nowadays um, in some artist shops. Um, I had to be shown I didn't believe that, <laughs> not being a painter myself. But it has these lines that clearly move all together. Mm. So that's something that I never thought about before somebody pointed it out. Um, there are traces of very big and very small brushes. 
so far. That's pretty much all we have, unfortunately. Yes. So this really is a largely unexplored field. The, to me, at the, least. Well, I have not seen, I don't think I've seen any literature on the Iron Age in regard um, to pigments and painting. It's, it's a very new field in archaeology because we needed more modern, very specific and mm. quite intense techniques to actually manage to find mineral pigments painted on mineral walls and they mm. fall in the earth. It's, you have to be really lucky and you have to know that you are looking for something like that. Yeah. Again, in archaeology, the majority of the time, what I've been told, what we have all probably been told, is when you dig something out of the ground, you have a post-excavation work. That is, take a brush and scrub the item, wash it. <laughs> so oh. if you are waiting for paint to come up, <laughs> all of these items now have been scrubbed to death. Uh, there are some incredible things. There is a painted conch, a, a massive, um, a massive seashell that you can blow in to make a noise. Uh -huh. Has a name. I do not find it, and that has been painted with spirals of dots going from a small dot from the inside of the of the shell to bigger on the outside in a spiral that seems to throw the sound out of the instrument. If that had been washed, I know there are some, and that's yeah. another question for Thea, actually, <laughs> some very specific techniques and analysis that can pick up molecular tra traces of pigments. But when you will see that item, whoever will go, do you know what? I'm going to analyze this. I reckon there's pigments on that bit of shell. Not many people. So unfortunately, we lose, uh, we lose a lot of information by the sheer training that we have as archaeologists. So that kind of work and that kind of questions hopefully might, might get things to change a little bit. And maybe people will consider not scrubbing everything before maybe analysis or even questioning what can be on it. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Thea, you want to, yes. you, do you have a question? I do. I do. Yes. Um, so it's a question for Kim. I was wondering, so you have quite a lot of expertise now in basically reproducing a certain recipe for a lake, I guess. So can you tell us What's the biggest challenge? So when you're trying to reproduce a certain recipe and you want it to be very accurate because you're trying to reproduce the method and to understand the artist. So what are the challenges that you often face in this process? I feel like, yeah. Sorry. The <laughs> biggest challenge is um, usually sourcing all of my materials. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of pigments that aren't so easy to find anymore. <laughs> um, so trying to find those is a bit of a struggle <laughs> at times. And then it's really, it's really about the ratios as well. Finding the right ratios, um, you know, it, there really isn't a recipe for a one size fits all. So when I kind of formulated mine, I took that from so many different resources um, to like try to actually figure out something that, that could be just a general starting point. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of the difficulty with every painting, because um, every painting is different, right? You know, you're learning different techniques constantly. Um, and using different materials that aren't necessarily what I would use for my own work um, and my own practice. So there's a learning curve with every painting that I choose to, to replicate, I guess. 
Um, but it keeps things interesting. It keeps things exciting. Um, and I'm constantly learning and then applying that to my own work. You know, it's, it's really funny when I start to do my own piece and then I'll be like, learn something I learned from a master doing a master copy. I'm like, oh, now I'm incorporating this into my own practice. And so I have little tidbits from kind of a bunch of different masters that I've tried to emulate. So it's fun. Um, but what I want to know from you, Taya, is when was the first time in history that humans fabricated a pigment through a series of chemical reactions uh, rather than foraging for their own colored materials? That's actually quite an interesting question because uh, most people would think that it happened together with the Industrial Revolution, right? Because that's when we associate, you know, this big change happening between something natural to something non-natural, chemical, synthetical, if you wish. Um, but actually it's much, much, much earlier than this happened for the first time. Um, and it happened in Egypt or somewhere in Mesopotamia, Egypt. Um, we are talking about the third third millennium yeah before christ so it's really long time ago like three millennia before christ people already knew how to put together several ingredients to make a pigment perhaps they didn't have the chemical understanding of the process that we do have nowadays but they definitely knew how to do it and uh, the pigment in question is called egyptian blue um and it, it can be made by mixing a source of copper with a source of calcium with silica, with quartz actually. And it's a partially vitrified pigment. Indeed, we do have evidence that it came probably from the, um, from the manufacture of glass. So they kind of started producing the, these pigments together with the uh, manufacture of glass and they were using it initially um, as a, um, um, uh, oh gosh, no, the word is, is, um, is going somewhere else. So they were using it to, to vitrify pottery. Yeah, so they were using it as a, as a layer to protect pottery. And then in a second moment, they realized that this could be used also as a pigment itself because it's a beautiful deep blue color. Um, but yes, it's often striking to think that in three, in the third millennium before Christ, people were already doing this process, this synthetic process is what we call it, right? Versus going there and look what the, for what Mother Earth gives you and look for a nice colored rock and then just pulverize it and grinding. No, really trying to, to make something out of scratches. This was already done back then. Um, and it is astonishing, it is astonishing. And if there is something that, um, a reason why I, I love my job is that it really makes me humble in a way, because I do think that our generation has, uh, well, I, I'm not my generation in particular, like our moment in history as humankind post uh, industrial revolution, we've got these um, kind of arrogance. We come to the world with this kind of arrogance because we know it more and we know it better and we are more technologically advanced. And of course, this is true on different levels, but it's striking to think that many things were already done in the third millennium before Christ. It's just striking to me. So, but yes, this is the answer to your question, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Should I keep going, Melanie, with another question? Um, I do have a question for, for uh, Caroline. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I keep forgetting to unmute. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead, keep going. All right. Um, so, I was wondering, Caroline, is there any evidence that pigments were used for other purposes than painting or writing? Uh, I was wondering this, like back in the, in the Iron Age. So do we have any evidence of, I, mean, I guess it's difficult because there would be no material 
evidence possibly, but do we know of anything of pigment being used for other purposes back then? So if it's not, if it's not for the Iron Age, <laughs> um, we find throughout prehistory quite a lot of um, graves, I want to say cremations as well, but mainly graves are uh, covered with pigments. So some might have heard about the Red Lady of Pavilion, um, who turned out actually to be a boy, but here you go. So it's, the body has been discovered, buried, and with a lot of red ochre powdered forms. Um, and people couldn't figure out at the time if it had been covering the grave itself. So just say, dig the grave, sprinkle it out with uh, red ochre, deposit the body, and close the grave. Or if it had been covering the body, if it had been covering a shroud or an animal skin or clothing that has been put on the body, in any case, it's completely covered under and on top of the skeleton, and that's the only thing that has been found, really. Um, so that, to me, is a very, very interesting one. Out of my geographical zone of northwestern Europe, which is very tiny, if you go to Turkey, Neolithic Turkey, so late Stone Age Turkey, um, around the area of um, Chatanhuyuk and so many other sites, there are some very odd graves, and it's specifically women and children. In these graves, there's tiny remains of azurite, uh, azurite blue pigments. Mm -hmm. That's very, very odd because azurite is really hard to grind to the right level to keep the color. So if you grind it too much, the color disappears. And you don't see it appear in any paints, manuscripts, even cosmetics in Northwestern Europe before a very long time. Um, to me, this, there's a mention in a Roman text. Um, I think it might be Vitruvius again. It's always Vitruvius anyway. That mentions that there's a, there's a mine of Azurites in Belgium. And they mine it specifically for azurite blue, that they turn into cosmetic pigments, especially for eyeshadows, more than paints. Um, and you have then to carry on reading other texts, uh, so you know that in Roman times, yes, ladies wear blue eyeshadows quite often, there's all sorts of things like that, but it's also used by ladies of the night to mention, to show as an advertising that they are working in that kind of um, of the side of things. If you have a lot of blue eyeshadow on, people know and recognize you as a prostitute. Um, so you have to make sure in high society that you don't wear too much eyeshadow for that kind of thing. It's mainly based on Azerite. But I'm always amazed that Neolithic Turkey has that technology already. We don't know if it was cosmetic and maybe just for funeral practices, if it was put in the grave, if it was in items. I haven't found any information on that in the, honestly, very few articles that I read about this very specific topic. For the rest, I'm personally very interested in the archaeology and the history of tattooing. Um, again, I usually work with earth pigments, but it then encapsulates some inks. And they are, as you said, it's carbon inks, usually. But, and that's a, I cannot remember the name of um, uh, the lady who does this research. So if you are watching, I'm so sorry, please do contact me. It's fascinating to me. There are some new analysis that instead of revealing only carbon-based pigments for tattooing, you might think about Ötzi, the Iceman that have been found in the Alps. You might think about um, the steppe mummies, uh, the Pratzeric mummies that are Scythian mummies with incredibly beautiful tattoos all over the bodies for both men and women. But all of that, even the um, Aztecs or um, so every South American mummies that you can find, that Egyptian mummies as well, that bear tattooings. I always had the question, if you had an analysis made with something that only picks up carbon-based pigments, would it be possible to realize that you are picking up only half the tattoos? Maybe some tattoos have been made with a non 
carbon-based ink. Say red ochre is used still traditionally in some places to make tattoo. Therefore, it wouldn't be picked up because it's not carbon-based. The thing is, somebody out there, if you are there, genuinely contact me, somebody out there does this kind of research and also used it on so Egyptian mummies and sailors, I think 19th century, sailors tattoos. And they are there. They are some non-carbon-based tattoos. So all the research that has been done might have been only half done. So it both fascinates me and terrifies me a little bit. But it's something that I would very much like people to look deeper into. Because if you go back to Iron Age, Germany and Northern Britain, they are mentioned of people painting themselves. I will not get into the question, the debate, and many of these questions um, here about the blue painted Celts, the blue painted Picts, not using woad. All of that is a completely separate research and involves an awful lot of discussion. But there might be some tattooing going on. There might be some body painting, augmentations, and so on and so forth going on. We have some preserved bodies, uh, bog bodies. Would it be possible to do search analysis on these bodies that are hopefully still in good enough condition to pick up some potentially iron-based, I'm thinking hematite, red ochre, and so on, uh, iron-based tattoo inks or body paints? That would be fantastic. And yeah, if you have the answer, <laughs> please let me know. But that's as far as I go. So if I understood correctly, you're asking whether we have the technology to pick up iron-based uh, pigments used as body paint on mummies. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. I mean... Mummies and the problem probably would be that bog bodies have been kept for so long into such an acidic, well, panic environment that it might impact. It usually destroys iron. Hmm. So... Yeah, uh, so if the iron has been destroyed, that's an issue, uh, <laughs> of course. Um, iron is relatively easy to pick up with what we call non-invasive analysis because it's a relatively heavy element, which means that we wouldn't have to destroy the specimen, whatever that is, in order to do the analysis. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't even need a sample. We could just, let's say, map it and find evidence of iron. But if the iron has been completely destroyed by the acidic environment, of course, it, it changes a lot. Now, let me tell you though, that when I was working on Egyptian manuscripts, I read an awful lot about um, what was used, recipes to, to erase an ink. So there was a very popular uh, type of ink known as iron gold ink, so it's iron based. It's the type of ink very popular in the Middle Ages. Um, and it was not easy to erase from the support because it partially penetrates the support itself, you know. Um, but there were recipes that were using like lemon juice or the milk, you know, when it's already kind of uh, started going acidic. So with sort of with an acidic attack, you can remove the iron because you destroy the complex and you just then you brush it away. You you just uh, dust it off once it's <laughs> once you, you or, or really or with a sponge you just uh, rub intensely and you manage to to get it off. However, in the test that I um, that we made, not me in in particular, but somebody from my uh, research group we could still pick up the iron inside the support even when you couldn't see the trace of ink anymore. So it really depends, to answer your question, it really depends on the condition um, in which the, um, the body is kept, the mummy is kept, and it depends on the level of uh, acid attack it's, um, it's, it underwent, basically. But just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean whether we wouldn't be able to pick it up. This is important to, to remember, especially, um, it's important to remember these for what you were talking about before, that many archeologists don't know, and they just 
wash everything or throw everything away because they can't see or sometimes they can see, but it just seems deterioration, so they just throw everything away. We are at the point in, in science and technology when we are able to pick up things that we cannot even see. So this is why it became absolutely paramount to try to document everything that undergoes in uh, that happens on the field so that we can then try to extract uh, the, the highest amount of information possible once they, everything comes to the, the lab. So yeah, there will be hope. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Such a good, that's such good news. <laughs> I would be hoping then if there's potential tattoo inks with iron-based pigments, if it penetrated the epidermis, then there might be some remains if it healed. I just cross my fingers and hope for the best, to be honest. Um, and talking about mummies, <laughs> I don't know why, an analysis. Uh, oh, it's because of the bandages around mummies, analysis, spectrometry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are some pigments that seem to be used as a paint or rubbed onto fabric that has been recently ish, recently ish, discovered in caves in Spain. Um, so I don't think they have found any binders. So the question is open: Is it just? rubbed onto the garment, the newly uh, woven cloth, or is it painted on it? But that seems to predate the invention of dyes, the invention of dyeing fabric in itself. Um, so I don't know if any of you, um, Kim, yeah, has any comparison, because it clicked with the legs being both a pigment, well, half organic, half inorganic, so both used in dyes and used in painting. Do you have any parallels with that, um, with, well, mainly the legs that you might be using or might be studying? No, actually, not currently. Um, but that's an interesting thought. Um, yeah, no, I've, traditionally, I think, um, you know, lakes were more used as, um, like, for layering. Um, in your underlayers um, and building up layers of, of soft, subtle light as well. Um, and a lot of impressionists use lakes in their shadows because uh, they felt that they gave their shadow colors a, a bit more of like a vibrant um, darkness, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, nothing with just rubbing them onto um, the substrates now. Um, I have a, a little note on that um, because I think that of course, historically, it, it, we do have evidence that dyes so organic matter because of its power to penetrate something was used for dyeing, right? So for dyeing even textiles. Um, and then as you were saying, Kim, you would have it to combine it with a substrate in order to use it as a pigment, right? Um, but I do think that um, even if we don't have much evidence of that, also pigments were used, I'm not sure, for painting slash dyeing textiles. And I think that Possibly this is something that has been done for quite a long period. And I'm saying that because last year, um, thanks to a friend, I came across a piece of textile, Islamic textile, dating from the Middle Ages. So probably around the 900 um, CE, Islamic. And it was dyed with soot, with charcoal, and we thought it was indigo because it had it had mm. this typical grayish bluish color, um, and so we thought it was indigo. And we did an analysis, and it turns out to be carbon. And it's just, you know, it doesn't seem possible that you are dying because you're not really dying. You're just putting pigments mm. onto something versus the actual the actual act of dyeing, of really the dye absorbing into the textile is very different. But I think that it must have happened. Perhaps we have less evidence of that because then that kind of uh, um, 
pigment on that kind of substrate would be easier to erase versus having a textile that has been dyed because it remains on the top of the surface. So you can, again, brush it away in a way. So, but I think it happened just perhaps in a, in, in, not as, as often as you would dye a textile, but um, if we would start looking for that, probably we would find evidence also of pigments used that way. Yeah. So we're getting close to coming to the end of our time. This has, this, this last bit of the conversation has made me wonder, does anybody out there know when the earliest recorded uh, dyed textiles, you know, what, what are the earliest recorded dyed textiles? I mean, and a question for Kim is, what is the earliest known use of lake pigments? Um, I mean, lake pigment uh, use goes back, I would say, as, as far back as the first millennium BC with um, the production of matter, matter lake, traditional matter lake. Um, so quite a long time. I, this, it's, it's, it's interesting that this isn't necessarily new knowledge, um, but, but that it, it seems to be a new subject for so many people. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like our contemporary knowledge is is partly busy reconstructing ancient knowledge, things that were done for you know thousands of years in the past, and that we've lost touch with since the Industrial Revolution. And yeah. often it feels like we're reinventing the wheel, but if we you know, stop and, and even just think about how would they have done this in the past? Did they do this in the past? And, you know, kind of follow that example. We might, we might not have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> um, okay. Is there, there are a lot of um, comments in the, in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, one woman, Vanessa Bunton, said mercury was often used in Mesoamerica for tattooing, which just makes me shudder. But I've asked her if she could um, tell us what the what her source for that information is, and if it was mercury, mercury, you know, the heavy metal, or if it was cinnabar, because there it's different compositions there. Um, does anybody, does anybody out there have any, any information on any of the discussion today? Can you contribute, you know, anything along these lines? You can go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, if you click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. You can raise your hand. In the meantime, <laughs> sorry, I just have a question for Kinta or anybody else. Um, I still don't quite understand why, if lakes are fugitives, right? Why do people? I st still modern artists, isn't it? We still use lakes nowadays. So why are fugitive colors? used, have been used, and are still used. Well, I think um, for some artists, I think a lot um, for the Impressionist artists, uh, like Van Gogh, it was about it, their vibrancy. Um, and even though they knew that the colors were fugitive, um, many of them, like Van Gogh, um, thought that if they applied them boldly that they would retain their permanence and this is obviously not true. Um, Agulis Pigments has, has a um, question or a comment. Oh. Hello. Hi. Oh, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. 
I'm uh, Maria from Agulis Pigments, uh, co-founder of uh, this company. So what does our company? Uh, we uh, main, mainly uh, produce earth uh, pigments based on iron oxides. So uh, they are all natural uh, iron oxides. Uh, also, you can find uh, travertine in our uh, color range. Uh, you can find uh, different uh, stones and etc. So basically, uh, now we have uh, 16 uh, colors and uh, they, they are all uh, manufactured from Armenian lands. And uh, we don't uh, mix uh, any pigments to make new shades or something else. So this is a short summary for our company, what we do. And... Uh, hello. Hello. Oh, yes, yes, let me continue. So uh, regarding uh, where can uh, earth pigments be used? Uh, I will just uh, tell a little information from our country because uh, Armenia uh, had and also has a big uh, history about uh, their uh, culture uh, and how uh, they, uh, the pigments uh, has been used in uh, Armenian culture. So, uh, natural pigments uh, has been used in rock uh, manufacturing, in pottery, in art, in conversation, in restoration, and in many, many other applications. So, what refers to uh, coloring rocks, uh, to uh, like make, like uh, giving, uh, the, uh, giving, uh, giving natural uh, color to clue, uh, and uh, a friend of uh, ours uh, used uh, our pigments and uh, there were a secret technology uh, he didn't uh, tell us, but uh, he told that uh, in uh, using uh, like, uh, uh, like um, uh, he, was, he was using vinegar uh, for uh, like a technique uh, to um, to make uh, uh, clue uh, uh, colored. It doesn't matter what kind of pigment it is and what uh, technical data they have, uh, what elements they have. But they use the vinegar uh, especially. I don't know if this information will help you somehow because uh, I heard that uh, there were uh, uh, question about how earth pigments were used like uh, in textile Le yes so this is a short information uh, we uh, have learned about uh, making rocks yes so a friend of uh, ours uh, he was uh, making also uh, uh, rocks uh, like again giving colors from uh, natural dyes but uh, this uh, technique was also very interesting. So uh, if anybody has any question uh, for us, uh, uh, please uh, let me know. Uh, by the way, uh, we export uh, our products uh, to many countries in the world for different applications, also uh, for art and for restoration. So uh, if you have any question uh, that uh, I will uh, know the answer, <laughs> I will uh, be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, Maria is the co-founder of Agulis Pigments and they are listed in our uh, special uh, link section as a purveyor of very nice pigments. They have a wonderful selection. Uh, it's, it's amazing the, the variety of colors that they produce. Um, so is there anybody else who uh, has a comment or a question? 
If not, we're going to wrap up this session. I want to say thank you, huge thank you for Kim, to Kim, Taya, and Caroline for being here today. Their expertise is really fascinating. And I've got lots of questions for them <laughs> that I'll be sending along. <laughs> and if any of you have questions for them, there you can follow them on Instagram. Uh, their websites are all available. Um, everything, all their information is listed on our website. So you can follow up with them and just keep track of their research. So thank you. I really appreciate everybody participating in this. We are going to move on to Catalina. Catalina Christensen is one of PRI's board members and she is absolutely wonderful to work with. There is something just magical and so refreshing about her. She got special permission from Mr. Nicholas, who owns, who currently owns um, L. Cornelison's, who are the oldest pigment purveyors in the UK. And I did a little bit, bit of research. Somebody told me that Sennelier might be older, but looking at the dates, I think Cornelison's beat Sennelier by a year. <laughs> so that would make them one of the very oldest pigment purveyors existing in the world, at least in the Western world. I don't know about Asia. I can't speak to Asia. But she got, Catalina got special permission to do a virtual field trip for us at El Carnelison's. And Lucy Mayas, who is a former Carnelison employee, went along with Catalina and helped explain and share little tidbits and secrets that the ordinary you know, uh, consumer would not have run across in Carnelison's. With that, I'm going to try to share my screen. <laughs> Hang on just a second. And Catalina, is there anything you wanna say before we start? Um, no, I just, I mean, the only thing is that for me, I know the place for many years and I love it since I came to London and that little trip opened so many possibilities, so many questions from that shop that I hope you also enjoy it. And it is an amateur film. I'm not a filmmaker. It's just a casual trip to Cornelison. I hope you like it. Um, and remember, after the video, we will be doing show and tell. So I want to see what all of you have brought. Let's see. Oh, come on. Hello, I am Catalina Christensen, and I would like to take you in a journey through El Cornelison and Son, the oldest artist color man in the UK, a magical place full of treasures. But first, I will tell you a little bit about its history. El Cornelison was founded by Louis Cornelison, a Belgian lithographer living in Paris. According to the grandson of Louis Douglas, the painter L. M. W. Turner persuaded Louis to move to the safety of London after the riots brought by the Revolution of 1848. It is thought that Louis settled in London working as a lithographer in Drury Lane. In 1855, Louis opened his own shop, L. Cornelison and Son, in Great Queen Street. Here you can see a photograph of the shop with William Toms, one of the employees at the time. The shop was selling pigments, printmaking suppliers and engraving tools. The company played a historic role as a lithographic color maker from 1862 to 1962 and as an artist color man 
from 1881. The family business closed in 1977 after the death of Len Cornelison, but was reopened by Nicholas Walt in 1979. When the lease expired, the shop moved to 105 Great Russell Street, where you find it today. A late century building with an early 19th century wood front with a slightly projected shop window. As you can see, the facade is the same as before. The interior original Victoria cabinets were relocated, as you will see later. The shop window is a magnet of color with display of the incredible products. At the top of the window, you can see the drawings of two medals and a family coat of arms. Actually, they have won four prize medals in Paris, 1867, and Vienna, 1872, and also in London, 1862, and Paris again, 1878. But the window to the right was broken, so the medals need to be drawn again in the new glass. Here you can see all the medals and the family coats of arms. As pointed out by Nicholas Walt, it is the same as Napoleon's. Now, at the same time that we hear from Lucy May, I am going to give you a quick tour of the whole shop in order to get an idea of the atmosphere and size of the place. It is intimate, it brings you back in time. You feel like it has been there forever. Lucy, how did you come to work here? I started working here four years ago and it was only ever supposed to be a little pit stop. And I was just working in the shop, in the retail, doing a few more jobs that led me to kind of work downstairs. And so I was doing things like um, making the pigment colour charts decanting lots of ink um, for our historical pigment range, um, pigmented ink range, and um, also working with suppliers um, for the supplying of our pigments from all over the world. Um, so it was a really interesting job because although I started in the shop, it allowed me to do so many other things. And, and actually, I do really miss working in the shop because the people that you meet and the conversations you have are just so interesting. Every day is different, every customer is different and they always have a different query um, for you to answer and, and help, you know, it's all about facilitating um, the craftsmen, the artists that come in here with whatever they need and so it's it's a little bit more like a kind of help desk for artists. Yeah. So you have um, learned a lot about anything to do with printmaking, pigment, yeah. colour. Yeah. What was the most amazing discovery you have done in the shop? I think it's really about um, people that work here and how amazing they are because each person has their own um, body of knowledge and they're experts in their own field. So we have printmakers, painters, building experts, um, for example. And so everybody brings their own expertise to the team. And so learning about all of their different crafts was a really exciting thing for me. And it allowed me to have a kind of basic knowledge of lots of different specific skills. Um, such as gilding, which is just a complete world of its own. Um, and so that's the really, really special thing about this place, is that it's a hub of knowledge. And that knowledge has really grown exponentially from during the 166 years that this has been an established. This place is a very interesting and vibrant place, because not only do you have the kind of my colleagues who are <clears throat> Um, animating all the material and disseminating lots of knowledge and information. You have this very large archive of material from throughout time um, and it's very special and very rare, a lot of the materials. Um, we've got, for example, some of um, George Fields pigments, which are very rare. We've got some genuine Indian yellow. Wow. Which is, um, any chance to see any of it? Maybe. <laughs> oh, that would be lovely. I would love you to show us some special yeah. things that we will normally not see. Yeah.
Yeah, for me, this is a magical place. It's an explosion of color. I always, I always get very happy when I come here. I wish I could just try every single material because everything looks so appetizing. Yeah. And the possibilities of trying something new are incredible. No. And I like that it has kept, like in the old days, they haven't modernized. They have yeah. kept their image. And it has been the same for hundreds of years. And I like that. And they cater for artists, they cater for artisans. I think that's yeah. very important, yeah. especially in our days. Yes. And calligraphers, calligraphers, very much. So we've got a large section of calligraphy goods um, and also a lot of specialist decorators. Um, a lot of our brushes, um, we have specialist um, builders come in to do all these different techniques with plasterwork, for example. So um, there are all these different areas that are used by different um, uh, different people, different craftsmen. So. Great! Should we have a little look around? Yes! <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so this is our main pigment um, area. I kind of call this the, our iconic um, wall of pigments. Um, these are all the pigments that we currently sell. Uh, there are a few more, which are maybe even more kind of rarer colours, which we keep, um, we don't have display uh, bottles of. Um, but we've also got quite a few binders in dry form, gums, fillers, waxes. We've got lots of shellac at the top there. Lots of waxes, because they all have different properties. And most of these materials are used to make um, different kinds of oil painting mediums, but they're also used as the raw materials for um, some printmaking processes. And the waxes are often dissolved um, in solvents to make um, thick impasto style painting mediums. Um, and then down here we've got all of our oil paints which are artist quality um, brands and what's quite nice about the shop is that it's very hands-on so if the customer wants to come in and they like the look of the the earth colours up here they can just go into the cupboard below and all of those colours will be down here oh let's see so it's all pre-packaged but originally in our shop on great queen street some of the decanting actually happened in front of you, oh, so it was almost like yes. an old kind of pharmacy or something yes. like that, where it was a little bit more theatrical or um, bespoke in a way. So, but these are all pre-measured now, so they start usually in 100 grams um, and they overcome in a plastic um, pot, which is very helpful. And people hopefully will reuse these or paper packets. Um, so can't always see the colours because they're in the papers, which are quite exciting. Oh, Iridium, cadmium. And what is the biggest size you sell? I can see oh, one kilo? Or we, more? Do, we do a kilo. Okay. We do three kilos and five kilos. Oh my goodness. The, okay. um, the larger sizes um, are to order, so yeah, we, would, okay. we would have to be um, anything above one kilo usually. You have to, um, order, have to order especially, yeah. <coughs> Unless it's an earth colour. Let me then... see the blue ones. Oh, that's blue. my favourite yeah. colour. <laughs> oh, so my these goodness. are all um, of ultramarine. So very subtly different. Yes. I love the nuances. I work with nuances. Yeah. <gasps> that is so incredible. Wow, that one is yeah, stunning. Yeah, phthalo. blue. Cobalt blue there. This is gorgeous. Uh, this is azure blue, which is... um. A mixture of different pigments. Um, that is incredible. But these are heavy, these are really heavy. Yeah. So all of this wall which I'm going to show you is full of all the colours that you can buy in different sizes that relate with this fantastic wall on top. Okay Lucy, I think this place has the most incredible Victorian furniture and they look stunning and I am very curious to know what is in these uh, little drawers and places. Could you tell me what is your favourite uh, thing here? Uh, I, I love the gold. 
Um, we, ha we sell here lots of loose leaf gold and transfer leaf, which is when the gold is pressed onto wax paper. And so a lot of these drawers here are just chock-a-block full of lots and lots of books of gold. And that oh my to me is quite magical. But we also have brushes and burnishes that are all used to apply the gold as well. But um, but actually, it's the rarer pigments that I'm interested in. Can so I show you? Yes, please. So in here we've got some smalt and we have it in two grades. We have a dark and a light. It's very subtle. The main difference is the dark is ground um, less. So it's less fine. It's yes. a coarser grade. And so that, that actually means that it, it, it appears darker um, as a pigment because of the way the light refracts through the, um, the structure of the pigment. So um, those are two, two colours that I really like. But this section of drawers all have the rarer colours in. So um, in number 21, which I remember, is the lapis lazuli. Oh, my goodness. Um, so you've got the light... Um, medium and then the dark which is that one it's very subtly darker yeah, very very subtle um, this is a beautiful beautiful colour um, 19 oh we've got Egyptian blue oh my goodness yeah She's actually a kind of glass. It's called. It's it's a. It's like a frit. Um, Have you used it? I've used it. It's very. It's quite granular, but it's a very interesting, quite soft blue. Um, you do need to layer it up to get an intense blue. Um, Which medium do you use it? Um, that one casein casein okay. so which is a which is a milk derivative do you think i could use it with the uh, egg tempera this one with yeah you should do because you should. then you do the coatings yeah. oh nice you should be able to that'd be really interesting actually um we've got some cinnabar so mm -hmm. some natural vermilion oh, here and um, this is a mineral pigment it's a really great intense orange this one's quite toxic though yes. so you have to be <laughs> quite careful here um, we've got some carmine, so some um, some cochineal. It's uh, similar to cochineal and blue verdita, which is a copper-based pigment. And um, this one's handmade in the UK for us. Um, so there's just a few. Oh, some rose madder, um, which is a lake pigment derived from a, dye, a natural dye. It's a gorgeous pink. What about verdigris? Verdigris, yes, you've got some verdigris. I just need to look where that one is. <laughs> so verdigris should be in here. So, so that is the verdigris there. This is a very blue oh, type, very, very blue. Very yeah, blue. Yeah, because mine gets, I, I experiment yeah. and it's more green. Yeah, yeah. This is um, this is made um, actually in a very pure way. So it's pure copper, pure acetic acid. This is made to um, a high standard actually in a laboratory. Um, and it's ground quite coarsely. So you'll find when you do make the paint, it will go lighter. Okay. And um, we also have um, in here some synthetic malachite, which is copper carbonate. Um, this is a synthetic version of the natural stone. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's really, really nice. Um, and that's lovely green. Do you see it in the UK? Or? This one, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm okay. not sure about that one. Okay. Um, and we've got, and then here, this is the genuine malachite. So you can see it's a lot yes. softer. It's more closer to kind of um, green earth almost, actually. It's a very, very soft one. Um, so, that's, so you can see the difference. It's quite yes. large. Um, yeah, so that is draw number 15. Over in this section, this is where all the gold is. Um, it's not that inspiring though when you look at it in here because it's just all folded neatly yes. and in these beautiful little packets. I was reading that you sell like 36 colours of gold, is that correct? It's quite a few. <laughs> I thought it was impressive. It's one of the um, gold leaf charts that we have. This is variegated also known as Dutch metal traditionally um, and it's got lots of different metals um, mixed in each of the sheets so you get these amazing That's um, incredible. I've never seen that before yeah it's gorgeous here's the gold one wow this is incredible
Incredible amount of so nuances. So you've got 24 carat going through 22 to 20, and then when it's mixed with other metals, you get these different um, colours come through. So you've got the green, white, and then a more kind of warm reddish, reddish, reddish tone. And then over here, we've got the more silvery colours, genuine silver, platinum, palladium. Um, and then these, these two here, which are gold, um, but they have quite a lot of silver in with them as well, so they're kind of quite soft, yes. softer. They kind of emulate what uh, low carat golds might look like when they um, have aged. Lastly, my favourite thing. The quills. Oh, oh my the goodness, they are so beautiful. So these are collected in the UK for us by a gentleman and he cures them and he cuts them. So he cures them in very hot sand. Ooh, and okay. he does make sure they're really clean first, but he cures them in hot sand and the hot sand um, hardens the, um, the end here. And then he cuts them to a quite a fine point. These ones are uncured, so they haven't been put in the hot sand. Okay. So they will be more fragile. Yeah, they'll be soft, much softer. Because when you do dip into the ink over time, in the session that you're um, writing or drawing or painting, um, it softens the tip, the nib. So um, if you use directly just an uncured, um, feather or quill you you won't get a very fine line um, and these are uncut as well so this this is literally just a cl clean yes. feather yes. so Catalina um you've visited Canellison many times before haven't you yes um in the shop what would you say is your kind of most exciting thing to look at for inspiration there are two things the pigment wall that we saw before I always love it is this explosion of color it makes me happy but also i would like to see pastels i love the colors of pastels and the different nuances so i believe we are in the pastel section we are so let's <laughs> see what we can find oh i love these rose. oh my goodness look at that so these these are sennelier pastels they are stunning the colors you get that's the blue wow Okay, and let's see, how many brands of pastel do you have? We've got about, I think, at least over five. So we've got Snellier, Rembrandt, Unison, Schmincke. Oh, this is like, a mixture of everything. Uh, these are pearlescent ones. Oh, yeah. a bit bright. Oh yeah, they're a bit shiny. And How they made them simmering? Oh, with mica powder. With mica yeah. powder. Oh, okay, that makes sense. What's quite nice is all of these. Here, these fingerprints. All oh, oh, look at the remnants. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> it's like a painting in itself. It is. Where do you have more pastels? <laughs> this Where? is beautiful. Yeah. These ones are made in England. Beautiful. These, these are the large ones, and they are. They seem to be a bit harder. A little bit harder but also depends on the colour so these are a little bit harder mm. this color, oh. and they're all hand rolled I so see that oh look at this for a landscape artist this must be incredible I almost feel like starting using pastels after <laughs> look at this these are incredible uh, let's see blue green air You'll often oh. see someone sitting here on a stool, looking through them or choosing. It's just incredible. This color is beautiful. Oh, this kind of no, they are all teal. beautiful. Very, very, very beautiful. Oh, look at this purple. That is incredible. Which other specialist areas would you like to show us? We have a lot of sign writers come into the shop buying not only gold, but also um, sign writing enamel paint. Um, this brand, One Shot, is made um, in the UK and they're incredibly bright and intense and they're oil based. Here on this colour chart you can see they're just so bright and amazing. Um, we've got quite a few of the lettering enamels here in Canellison and some of the um, bulletin ones there. 
Lucy, you had work a lot with inks. Would you tell me a little bit about it? Of course. So, Nelson used to sell a range of inks called the Penman Transparent Historical Inks. And they were derived from um, quite a lot of natural um, raw materials such as um, oak galls or um, other dyes from plants. Um, and they finished making those. So Canellison wanted to replace them with their own range. And so we commissioned a, a special um, ink maker in Cambridgeshire to, to make these inks here. And this is the Canellison Historical Ink Selection. I'll just go through a few of the names and a few of the kind of materials and um, to get an idea of, of the range as a whole. So the two that we have here are um, Oak Ghoul, which is a special ink made from um, tannic acid um, and gum arabic and um, at the top here you can see this gorgeous um, kind of almost warm undertone to the black that comes through and so it's made from these little oak ghouls or apples which are these and these are these are made by an oak tree in reaction to um, the the wasps that actually lay their egg or larvae in the buds and inside each of these is a lot of tannic acid and the tannic acid um, is a material that can be reacted with iron or iron sulfate in, its, in a very pure form to make an intense black ink. Uh, if you just boil these naturally by themselves they're just a brown, um, they'll make a brown ink but it, you really have to add the, the iron which in some cases um, historically, someone would have just thrown in a rusty nail um, to get that reaction going. And so these are ta these are, this here is a tannin-based ink, and so is um, this one here, which is actually made to the same recipe as Jane Austen's mm. ink. So it's a black ink, but it has quite a warm undertone, because instead of water that the oak balls are boiled in, it's beer. Oh, with beer? I haven't beer. tried that, because yeah. I have made the old yeah. gold ink. Yeah. Uh, with iron, but yeah. I have I have done it with water. Yeah, mm, not so you can actually for experimenting. Do, uh, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you can do it with beer. You can do it with wine. Will you tell us about these colourful ones here? Oh, okay. So the purple oh, here yeah. and the red, they are derived from cochineal. So this is actually um, a cochineal ink that's had the addition of something um, that's alkaline added and that pushes it towards a blue basically so it's more of a purple tone that you get whereas this one here is just the pure um, cochineal ink. Another red we have which is actually very similar to this is the Brazil wood ink which is a little bit more red and um, again it's um, there you go. It's an ink made from dye extracted from the from the wood of the Brazil wood tree, and the wood is boiled in vinegar with some water as well, and that extracts the um, this very rich red dye, and then gum arabic is added. There are some other ingredients as well, but it's a bit of a secret. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I can't say so I don't ask anymore. I, I love to experiment with yeah. these things. I have done a little bit of ink, but um, I love because you never know what you're going to get. For me, it's a surprise always, and I love that. Absolutely. And, and that's the kind of the joy of working with natural materials is that they, they, they change, um, you know, according to each year, each season. You never know what you're going to get or how much, how strong the dye is going to be from, um, from the starting material. Um, take for example these two. These are made from the same substance. So these are made of hawthorn berries. So we've got hawthorn yellow and hawthorn green. And the only difference is um, the green has been harvested at a different time in the year to the yellow. Oh, okay. Um, so you can get two different inks depending on, on what time yeah. in the season you, you pick them. So we can get an idea of the breadth of colours. This is a lovely um, walnut ink that Canelson has as well. It's very deep. So you have that and then you have... I like to do my uh, frozen ink. Yes. And I use those for that. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Yeah. 
I got inspired one day that I came to buy a mullet, I think it was. Yeah. And then yeah, started walking exactly. around. I, you know, every time I come, I go out with something new yeah. to experiment. Yeah. This here are beautiful. Oil pastels. Yeah. Stunning. Lucy, what do we use these for? These are colour shapers. They're used to blend different media. So um, they're often used by pastel artists. Um, to make a very smooth graduated um, tone uh, but also painters use them to move around the paint they're used by conservators to apply glue in very small places what are they made of silicon now we have gone to the mediums area which you have loads can you tell us a little bit about it these are mainly for oil painting and the mediums change the property of the paint layers. So they can do lots of different things. They can speed the drying time, change the consistency of the paint, the way it handles. Um, and here we've got very traditional mediums that have been used for hundreds of years. We've got lots of different oils as well, which are uh, used to make paint as the binder, but also to thin the paint. Um, it allows the paint to dry slower and um, and also it will increase its gloss as well and blending it helps a lot with blending this small cabinet on the top contains lots of drawings with equipment for calligraphers these drawers are a treasure they contain lots of different pen nibs holders and many different types and brands of nibs. We have William Mitchell nibs of all types, Grouse and Joseph Gillot, and finally Leonard nibs. Incredible collection. This is Philip Poole, pen man of London, who had a shop in Drury Lane until the rent increases too much in the 19s, so he moved at the end to the back of Cornelison's shop in Great Rosalie Street where he worked until the end of his life. And now Lucy is going to show us some very special materials. This jar is full of genuine Indian yellow. This is one of many jars from the museum. It's the pigment in its ball form. It's been pressed just with water um, into balls, which originally would have been kind of like the size of your palm. And so this is the balls that have been broken up um, into these smaller chunks. And so you can see, once the surface is disturbed, you see this amazing um, orangey yellow come through. Yeah, I was going to say this looks very brown. It looks very dull, yes, doesn't it? Yes. We can get one out and have a look, actually. Um, we'll do, you want to, do you want to smell it? Because you know what it's made from, don't uh, uh, you? Yeah, it's the made of the urine of cows that were fed with mango leaves. Exactly. Let me see. I'll try. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. What, what do you think it smells like? It smells like urine. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Oh wow, that is incredible. It's incredibly has an incredible high tinting strength, and it's very transparent. But what makes this a really interesting pigment is when it's very good for glazing and thin transparent layers, and you can build up the layers to create this intense. But do you sell loads of these? We don't sell this uh, one. I thought you cannot no, get no, no. them anymore, so... No, we don't sell this one, okay. um, because it's so very cruel. So people cannot use it anymore? It's banned. The I production know, yeah, that's banned. what I thought, yeah. so... Yeah, okay. So this, it was used by Turner, famously, in his watercolours. Mm, um, okay. So those really gorgeous, vibrant sunsets, he okay. used Indian yellow. It's rather a lot here. <laughs> and loads? And you say you have many We've of those many, photos. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. This is the kind of thing that it should be in a museum. People should be able to see, see it, this. Yeah. It will be, hopefully. I hope, yeah. Um, and so this, this colour, obviously, we, d we don't sell this original colour anymore. 
and it's part of the Knesset archive. Another thing that we have just to show you this video is um, it looks a bit like a hat box. Yes, I was thinking, what <laughs> I'm not going to get a beret out of here. Oh, wow. This is genuine rose madder. It's quite rare these days to find a rose madder pigment that's this bright. Yes. And so this is um, is actually a Le Franc and Bourgeois pigment, um, probably from the 20, early 20th century. Um, but it's it's absolutely stunning. It's it's so rare to find it. So in this. this is just part of the archive. Part of the archive. Do not sell that. No, we don't yeah, sell this one. Right. Yes. Uh, the one that we sell now is in its dry form doesn't look as bright but actually when you do mix it with a binder it comes through but is a that very... this, uh, what, what is... oh no it's still a genuine, oh, it's still genuine. madder okay. pigment and this of course um, is derived from the madder plant the root yes. um and this is a lake pigment so we keep it out of sunlight because it is yes. fugitive it might yes. fade um over time what does it say it just says genuine rose madder okay beautiful it's quite special in this little, little yes, hat box. Yes, precious, very precious. There we go, there we yeah. go. I think we have covered an incredible amount of ground. My idea with the film was to give people, especially people that cannot be in England, yeah. an idea of what the shop has and how many things you can get for all kinds of art or arts and or builders needs and i think we have covered that quite well yeah. so thank you very much lucy You're so welcome. i really thank appreciate you. all your knowledge it's fantastic <laughs> thank you very much thank you so catalina you've been coming in here for quite a few years what makes canalison special to you or makes the, the shop this very special place to visit i i, I love for, as i said before the color when you come in it's just it makes me so happy because it's color everywhere but also i like that it's a specialist shop that is is good for artists it's good for artisans it's good for the building trade it's trying to cater for all these people and i think that's very important and you can find for printmaker lithography uh, oil paint I mean, you name it, gold leaf, etching, you sell things for all of these disciplines, which in a small place, uh, I love that. I really think that it's a very important thing to have in these days. And I like the fact that it, got, it hasn't really changed with time. You have all these Victoria cabinets that are beautiful. And when you come in, it's, it's a small shop, relatively. But as you have seen it now that we have been talking for half an hour, there is so much in here that you will find anything you want. And as far as I know, if you don't have it, you will find it also. I think that you send materials all over the world. Uh, and, you know, famous people have come, and new beginners are coming, mm -hmm. and everybody can get what they want. That is very important, I think. Wonderful. And Catalina, isn't it amazing that this is the last colourman here in the UK? Um, there's Sennelier in Paris, Zecchi in Florence, and Canellison here in London. It's a really, really special, rare place. And what I find very, very interesting about the idea of colourman or the colourman as a, a retail space is it really came out of the pharmacies and so pre-Victorian times you'd go into a pharmacy and there would have been a section for dyes and pigments because households would have used them in a much more rural form and they would have had these properties which people would have used outside of an art context for example um, natural earths um, like these ones here, uh, clays or iron rich clays would have been ingested um, to relieve um, stomach problems. And so you can see that this shop is very specialist and it came out of, um, of the pharmacies um, to kind of, as you said, to kind of deliver these goods to all of these different trades and all of these, these different industries.
Um, and that's really fascinating. No, I think it's fascinating also that people use pigments in all ways from hundreds of thousands of years ago. You know, they will ingest them for some medical purposes. They will paint their skin to protect them from insects yeah. from the sun. And they, they are continue with this tradition, which is amazing. Now, before we finish, I would like to present to you four questions I posted to Nicholas Walt, and I will narrate his answers. I was attracted and astonished by how this small shop had continued to trade for 122 years in the same location under the same family's ownership, specializing in the same materials, pigments and printmaking. A well-informed restorer and I purchased the name and the stock following the death of the last member of the family to Ron Cornelison. In the years that follow, I have met several people in the artist's material trade who were sent to investigate buying Cornelison months before we had even heard about it. This was the era of graphics, letter set, and bright ephemeral dye-based designer's wash. Cornelison was irrelevant to the mainstream creative trends of the day. This made it even more interesting. I would time travel backwards to my school and university days and study more physics and chemistry. I will then have the conceptual framework in place to understand the behavior of pigments and mediums. At Cornelison, we often talk about writing this book, Chemistry and Physics for Artists. We keep in touch with alumni and with their advice away from the daily demands of working in the shop, something like this may evolve. There has to be a plural in my response. The first concerns continuity. In a severe recession in the early 1990s, London Commercial Property Price plunged. Our landlord, a publisher, came under financial pressure and put the building on the market. I raised a loan to buy the freehold. Several years later, I sold the upper three floors in order to repay the loan. Both of our other businesses, Russell and Chapel, established in 1770, and Robertson, established in 1810, rent properties and both have had to change locations in the last 10 years. The second concerns my colleagues and our alumni. The Cornelis in Alumnus Network exists. We know we can be a useful stepping stone, working with bright, well-informed artists is the crucial element in the Cornelis project knowledge, enthusiasm to learn more, courtesy and administrative competence are my key criteria. They are two. The first is working, the second is not. I would like Cornelison to have a reputation for outstanding and sometimes unique products, especially in pigments, with excellent staff and a reputation across the world. The ingredients are in place and this is happening. The second is digitalization. I am ill-equipped on this dimension, the grown generation, but I know where we are to go. Before I finish, I hope the digital architecture will be up to date and moving forward. At the moment, we are about five years behind. Nicholas Wall's answers are a testament to his passion, love and care for the shop and the people who work there, as well as for the customers, a key ingredient in their success. I hope you enjoyed the tour of this magic place and all its treasures. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Catalina and Lucy. That is just it reminds me when I when I was a child, the first time my mother took me to a real art store, you know, rather than the dime store or, you know, whatever. And I just I walked in and 
almost immediately in front of me was this enormous rack of different colored inks. And I just stopped and stood there. Mom said my mouth was hanging open and she could swear I was drooling. <laughs> and I, she said, she told me I could pick five. I could, I could pick five colors from there because even back then they were still quite expensive. And I swear, I, I think I stood there for a week trying to decide which five colors I wanted most. It's, it's like walking into an amazing candy store and wanting one of everything and maybe 10 of some other things, you know, it's just, Thank you so much for taking us there. Um, wow, that was that was a lovely adventure. So we're going to move on here um, and try and use our time well. Does anybody? I know that a couple of people have already sent me things. We had a lot of problems with our Google Forms not working the last couple of weeks. So if you tried to submit an image for sharing, you know, I, I apologize for it not working properly. But if you have something today that you'd like to share, that's wonderful. I'm going to start off with um, something that Corey Wilmot shared that she sent me. Corey is a professor at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville in Illinois here in the U.S. And I met Corey a number of years ago and we stayed in touch. She um, has wears a number of different hats, but one of them is, you know, working with the museum at Southern Illinois University and she ran across this amazing, hang on, let me um, see if I can find her, find her picture. Corey, do you have it handy? I didn't bring it up, but I could probably find it pretty quickly. Okay, you could probably find it faster than I could. I'll, I'll look real quick, too. Come on. I thought I left it. I thought I left it open. But it's not showing up. I'm almost there. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> So when I met Corey, we did, she took me on this wonderful tour of the museum and we, I got to look at some real special pieces. My, my research has been primarily Northwest Coast indigenous art and they had some really interesting pieces at the museum. And I, so I got to see some cool stuff. It's not often that I'm able to travel and get into outside museums, you know, museums outside my region. So it was a lovely experience and they were absolutely the best hosts I have ever had in my life. I, I did not want to go home because they took such good care of me. <laughs> we enjoyed having you. Ah, thank you. I, I found my image. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Do you want to tell us about this? Sure. Um, I confess this is not in our university museum. <laughs> it's, it's actually somewhat famous in, in the field of um, woodlands, Native American art. And this is one, the back of one of a pair of dolls they're Queen Anne fashion dolls dated from 1770 to 1790 that are dressed in um, high, painted hide and quill worked garments thought to be from 
uh, the Saint uh, James Bay region off Hudson Bay. So they're in the Cumin Museum in London. So the the work that I've been doing lately just published an article on uh, Anishinaabe strap dresses that looks at strap dresses this style um, in collections around the world. But this color, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, I can. Okay, so this aqua color um, is, I've seen it. Now, I said this is from James Bay, Northern Canada, uh, 1700s, late 1700s. I've seen this color also on pieces from the plains mm -hmm. uh, in the mid 1800s and on pieces from Labrador Peninsula, um, 20th century. Uh, it's very common with indigenous dyes to find vibrant yellows, vibrant reds, of course, the natural white of the porcupine quill. Um, and, you know, those are the main colors, really, that you find. And you can see the rest of these dyed quills. There's the red, red, the yellow, um, some more red. Um, but I'm very anxious to find out more about this, uh, indigo, uh, this um, aqua color, which the only references I've found have been to leached indigo dye from trade cloth. Hmm. Um, and if any of you know more about indigo than I do, I have studied it sort of peripherally throughout the years. Um, but I understand that uh, if you don't dye it for the right length of time or with the right combination or the right this or that, it's very particular, you might end up with this aqua color. And also it's fugitive. Um, it wears off. It does not penetrate the protein of the quills. And when you see this color, this is very unusual for a piece this old to have this color intact. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes when you see this color, half of it is completely gone. You just see the impression of where it was on the leather and maybe a few little scraps of it here and there. Uh, so I'm anxious to learn more about, um, well, I guess indigenous quill dyeing in general, um, but with this particular color, it, it uh, requires more knowledge than I have about potential indigenous blue dyes or how realistic is it that every instance it occurs is going to be leached indigo from blankets or really more specifically broadcloth, which was circulating already in the 1600s in this region. So it's, you know, that we know they had access. Okay. Um, so we can post that question, you know, on the website or you can, you can do it yourself if you like, go to the Pigment Community Connections and there's a forum there, a discussion forum, where you can put questions where other people can answer. You can share information and knowledge that way. One of the things that struck me about this piece was that it's got both vermilion and um, red ochre on it. And it's kind of unusual to see both of those pigments used on the same objects. But I guess that doesn't really surprise me um, because at this point in time, as far as the paint is concerned, um, at this point in time, they're, they are getting vermilion through the fur yeah. trade and they're already used to using red ochre, which is what yeah. they would have used with um, fish egg um, binding. Well, there were a number of different binders that were used. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, you know, the, 
the the plane the the people back east and in the plains sections of both the U.S. and Canada had vermilion much earlier than we did out here on the west coast. But yeah. this is just an amazing little piece of work. <laughs> Every single one of those quills has been softened and then wrapped around a, a piece of leather or hair. Mm -hmm. And even the, the deer um, hair has been yeah. dyed with uh, either ochre or vermilion. Yeah. Yeah, there's beautiful. Vermilion. Here's the indigo here. Like the indigo dye is actually worked into the piece. Uh, in a number of places on on this um, hair binding and on the under the cuff here. Yeah, I see the the indigo fabric right here. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, this is the trade cloth indigo. This here and this here. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's hilarious that they took a European fashion doll and redressed her. <laughs> Well, there have been several articles written about this, these pair of dolls. They've been published um, since uh, maybe the earliest publication might have been um, in the 70s, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But they've been a point of fascination. <laughs> They're somewhat famous and controversial. Um, and I am actually proposing a new interpretation um, saying, in my interpretation, um, I think they, um, it was actually a Hudson Bay factor who commissioned the dolls to send back to the Hudson Bay in London to say, this is what our customers are using our goods for. <laughs> and so this is what you got to get on with sending us to trade with them. Wow, that's an interesting, that's an interesting interpretation. Yeah, the Hudson Bay was actually famous for, um, for that kind of correspondence with their mm -hmm. central office in London, because they were, you know, they were run from London, uh, as opposed to the other fur trade companies, which were based in North America, had a, a mm -hmm. closer handle on what, what, you know, who was, who was buying what, you know, what their popular products were. Yeah. And the Ojibwe were just moving into the area at this time. Uh, so it was a new factor to be considered, you know, what did the Ojibwe like to buy? All right. Well, thank you, Corey, for sharing this with us. Um, thank you. Let's see. I need to. I'll try to post that question. Someone I see just okay. put the link to the posting in the chat. Um, the next person who submitted an image was Judith Kruger, who has a background in Nihanga, which is a traditional Japanese art form. Judith, do you want to tell us about this image? I think it's absolutely sure. gorgeous. Thank you. So um, my I'm a primarily a, a painter. And... Um, they look abstract, but I call it rooted abstraction because um, it is very informed by the land. It's land driven and land made. So all of my materials, very rarely am I adding anything that is something that you can buy in an art store, except for when I'm dealing with reds, because I was, when I started this from 2001, probably to 2000 and nine or 10, I was using cinnabar and vermilion from China and Japan. And I now have a non-toxic studio. So my binders are actually hide glue and seaweed glue. And uh, seaweed glue is, is called funori. And I uh, cook it on the stove and um, extract it with cheesecloth and let it gel up and keep it in the fridge. And that is for very, very fine particles uh, like mica powders. And what you see here is uh, yellow ochre from California that I foraged and it's mixed with some mica powders. 
And so I will use the hide glue for the ochres. I have a ball mill in my studio to mill very finely and levigate. But if I really want to get them micronized, I have the micronized sieves for, for earth pigments, but for semi-precious stones um, and certain other more exotic minerals, I order them from Japan, um, from a small mom and pop purveyor. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with the new store pigment. I have not been there yet. Uh, I use a, a much smaller family owned operation and um, where I can color match and get what I need. And it is, um, I know the Corneliuson said that they um, already have it pre-packaged in Japan. They will scoop it out and, and get it for you in the amount of grams and weigh it as, as needed. And so it's a, it's a micronized system where the coarser, the mineral, the darker, the color, it's not a mixing system because every, every pigment has a different gravity weight. And so it's a layering system where you put the organic, the plant material underneath and um, get the saturation of color from the tannins of that. And it is not... Um, uh, I don't have to worry about the archival aspect because I'm covering it with my rock pigments on top. And so it gives a saturation. So, um, and, and it, you basically build up fine to coarse so that the coarser colors are on top and they have the, the matter, uh, a heavier matter to them. And then you're changing the refractive index of it. So what you're seeing here are two big canvases um, that I use raw linen and stretch it. And the, the one on the bottom is actually layers of quartz that I've um, ground in my studio. And then I um, tone it with uh, charred soot that goes on top. And then I build from there. The other one, I like putting disparate canvases together so that, um, and it's, it's a whole conceptual basis that I won't get into, but basically um, I feel like I'm very powerful putting all of these pigments from all around the world together where they would not come together. And so socially, um, you know, I wish that would happen with people. Um, and that's it. So you're looking at different ochres over indigo on the top panel. And then the indigo has to go on top of a very coarse black oxide um, so that it kind of goes in the holes and you get the glisten of it. Thank you. So. Um, if anybody wants to contact Judith, I... Do you want to post your um, website? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's judithkruger.com, and I teach this all over, so um, I will put it in the chat. Okay, thanks, Judith. So does somebody want to share? You can raise your hand. I don't see anybody. I actually have something I want to share. And I'm hoping I can, you can actually see it. This is a very unassuming looking material in this jar. It is called mother ochre. It's a bio ochre. It is something that naturally forms in, in um, slow moving water. If you're walking, you know, if you're walking around and you see this red kind of scummy stuff in a puddle or in a ditch, um, in, in a pond, whatever, that's bio ochre. It is a very interesting material. Uh, there's a little bit of research that's being done on it now. Brandy McDonald, who has done a lot of rock art research all over the world is one of the few people who has actually looked at this as a pigment because it was used in um, just actually a few miles from where I live 
for painting rock art, indigenous rock art, thousands of years ago. And they, they collected this and they dehydrated it and then they cooked it, they roasted it to come up with this absolutely stunning red. It's just kind of a, a very non, let me see if I get better light on it. It's kind of a very nondescript ochre color right now. Ah, my arms aren't long enough to hold everything. And it looks like, in some cases it looks like, you know, kind of a reddish sediment. In other cases, it's like, it looks kind of like it's curdled. And in other cases, there are long streamers of it that kind of look like long, um, long, long clouds or something. So it comes in, in just a wide variety of, of shapes and forms. This, um, Heidi Gustafson collected this for me last year at, um, from a spring. And over the winter, it sat on the back of my desk under a lamp and I watched it reproduce. It actually reproduced itself. It grew its own algae. It created oxygen. There was a, a period of a couple of months where it was really beautiful. It had all of these little uh, oxygen bubbles on the surface of the, of the sediment. And they just shone in the light like little little jewels and it got bigger you know over the last few months it's a very interesting material and i think that a lot more people are going to start taking a look at at biogenic pigments something that hasn't been very deeply explored at least you know in contemporary times but there is more evidence coming forward about it having been used, about biogenic materials having been used in the past as pigments and as other things we don't know yet. So I want to thank everybody for taking time today to, to, to join us for this. This is the official launch day for Pigments Revealed International. I have a board of 12 or 11 people other than myself who have been absolutely amazing to work with. Without them, this dream could not have, this dream could not have come forward. We are building a global pigment community and PRI is committed to helping with education and research um, related to pigments. We have a hand up. Hi, Kathy. You want to go ahead and unmute? Yeah, hi. Um, I'll turn on my video. I'm just um, really interested in, in what you just said because I've been collecting on a trail I go on often. Um, and like you said, it seems to keep reproducing itself. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of leaves with it as well, like mm -hmm. there's of organic matter, um, but it's a very slow moving stream. Mm -hmm. So I collected and um, dried. Oh, nice. And I dehydrated it. And then, uh -huh. I, and then I mixed it up with gum Arabic. Um, can, yeah. we see, can we see it painted out? Yeah, uh, you can see that corner under the charcoal. Uh -huh. um, that's, it's painted on co a cork board. Wow, that's a great well, color. It is a really beautiful color. I don't know how well it comes across on the screen, but um, yeah. The, it, the interesting thing about this stuff is that it, it's a, bac it's a bacteria, I believe, but it will eventually evolve into a solidified form of ochre. That's oh. why it's called mother ochre. It, it has this entire evolutionary process that's really fascinating, and I don't know nearly enough about it to explain it. Yeah, I'm going to go get 
some and put it in a jar like you have and watch it for the yeah. next months. I'd love to see. Yeah. yeah, this is this is my new favorite pet. <laughs> yeah. Because um, it, it, it is obviously something that's alive. Yeah. Yeah, that that's yeah, that's just so interesting to me anyway. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? But uh, Jasmine's got her hand up. Um, go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, I'm, I'm here in um, Eastern Australia. I don't know if there's anybody else in that area, but um, there's a lot of ochre around and there's something that's pretty similar to the color that you're getting over there. Can you mm -hmm. see that? And uh, these are just like ones collected from the stream, uh, like a pinky colors, yellowy ones. So they yeah. various colors. And um, yeah, we just, we painted our bodies. We painted a shroud recently um, for a natural burial. Um, ah. So we've, we've used them, I use them in my watercolor paintings. Um, I've yeah. seen some amazing yellows come out of Australia. Yes. Some of the best yellows I've ever seen come from there. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, somebody else, if you want to put your hand up, you can click on reactions down below and that will pop a little yellow hand up that we can see. Nobody else? Well, I think that it's quite late in some places right now. So I just want to thank everybody for taking the time today and stay tuned because PRI is working hard on adding content to the website all the time. And we're working on developing our programming that will include a lot of material, um, educational materials. We'll be, you know, we'll, having, we'll be having monthly um, events that, you know, range from guest lectures to Q and A's. We will have a monthly um, show and tell section and a monthly happy hour as, as well as a bunch of other stuff. So just stay tuned because more will be revealed. <laughs> Thank you all. If anybody wants to hang out for a few minutes and just talk, that's fine. We can do that. Um, if you do want to talk, I would ask you to turn on your video and unmute. I'll just add a quick something. Maybe I'll turn on my video. I don't know what my hair looks like. I just want to say thanks so much. I didn't realize I, I was a pigment collector. I thought I was <laughs> kind of a chunks of something collector. When we lived in Australia, I similar um, to Jasmine's there, I had chunks of kind of reds and browns and yellows. And then on the beaches of Whitstable, North Kent, I collected the bits of chalk that had washed up and bits of charcoal. I, I'm not sure where the charcoal comes from on the beaches of North Ken, but all of these things I collected. And then your last talk, um, some people were talking, uh, I think one woman was talking about found um, pigment element, like things in London. Um, and she was making art from that. And it really inspired me. So I've been really looking and just around my house, <laughs> I find <laughs> chunks of rock and, and chunks of color that I've collected over the years that I'm really excited to kind of do something with, especially with my kids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one, because I've got four kids and it will save a lot of money. Uh, two, they're natural. <laughs> and, and I've just been really inspired. I feel like I found a community of people that I really, um, well, that I understand. I don't know. It's, it's, thanks for bringing this together. You know, I'm, I usually don't have my camera on and I'm usually looking after my kids while, while these chats are going on, but I really feel um, at home here. And thank you for bringing all these expert people together. And Catalina, thanks for going to that shop. You know, I've walked by it a, a thousand times to going to the British Museum. And I mean, not a thousand, maybe about 10 times and never popped in and look at like, wow, I'm definitely going. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Thank you, Angela. I think 
you know, I hear a consistent refrain from pigment people about, yeah, I've always collected, you know, these bits of rocks and dirt and, and everything, you know, even as a child, a lot of us did this. And it, it takes a while to, to figure out, oh, I'm collecting colored materials that can be used. Yeah, it's fascinating too to hear all of the uses because I also, I make silver um, jewelry and I have enamels for enameling on my silver jewelry and I've got all sorts of different transparent and opaque colors. But I'm, I mean, just just now I was thinking, actually maybe I can somehow use some of my pigments eventually when I learn more on how, how they mm -hmm. use and how they fire in, in, in that enameling um, work. I don't I'd know anything about it, but yeah. I bet there's somebody at Cornelison's who could help you. <laughs> Oh, wow. Amazing. Uh, I'll spend a lot when I go there. So I better <laughs> say, <save up. laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks very much. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I'm just really happy that, that you found us and that you feel at home. And, and keep up with be... these, um, these lovely Instagram posts. And I love Instagram because it seemed to connect all of these people. Like what you're doing is great. You know, I, I really, it's amazing, actually. It's a real revelation that there's so many people out there with a similar interest, but really across the globe. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of us, a lot more than anybody realizes. And that's a really wonderful feeling. And to be able to have people come together and share what they know, share their experiences and, and share their favorite materials and stuff. I mean, I love that. And getting to see other people's studios is always so much fun. And this kind of sleuth detective work, you know, with that green, with the Native, um, with the Native American doll work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was raised in Alberta near the Blackfoot community. And I know they use some, I can't, I'll, I'll do some research, but I know they use some plant materials to make their greens. Oh, yeah. Nice. So I, I don't know if that could be part of that, but also that um, kind of surge in Native use of, um, indigenous um, Canadian use of um, those greens was, I read somewhere about the, um, you know, the Venetian Murano green glass beads. Mm -hmm. And when those, they started trading those, they were using them a lot in the, in the costumes and the, and the jewelry. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking for dyes to replicate those kind of very bright green colors. So I wonder if there's some links there too, with kind of a surge in those, the importing of those Venetian Murano glass beads and the green use in the um, kind of the textiles and jewelry. Interesting. Yeah, there, there are, I've, I've actually done, my, my research focuses on indigenous use of pigments. And so I do have a little bit of information about that if you, Super. If yeah. you want more. Yeah. I, I'm not going to bore everybody with it right now because if I start talking about it, I'll talk your legs off. Well, we look forward to a talk from, from you in future, <laughs> in one of these workshops. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Is Kennedy has his hand up. You wanna um, unmute and turn on your camera, Kennedy? Yes, I'm, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I apologize. My camera's not uh, seeming to work, which honestly might be for the best. I'm cleaning today and listening to oh. this, so I, I might look a little rough. I think I have to change some settings. But um, no, my my dad would tell you to get a bigger hammer. <laughs> that, that was his solution to all kinds of problems. <laughs> I love it. It kind of sucks. I actually pulled some um, some pigments I wanted to show as well. So oh. maybe next time. But. Um, but yeah, so anywho, I, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm uh, from Minnesota. Um, I'm just like 24, so I'm kind of just getting into pigments. Um, and I, I found it in my undergrad, undergrad studies. Um, I was a fine, art, fine artist uh, major and then also anthropology and stuff. So these conversations and these talks are amazing because they pair both of those fields together really well. And um, I just...
just want to say how much she ate you guys putting this together and what a great resource because as far as I know I don't know anybody so far around me who is also into the pigments um, in, in the natural raw foraging or just you know process in that sense and so it's really refreshing and amazing to have this community so um, I just want to say thank you for for hosting these things it's amazing and I've uh, gone to every single one so far that I can tell <laughs> that I can and um, I can join so um, these are always leaving me inspired um, to do more research and to create and everything like that. I'm still in the very beginning years of, of understanding the whole process and stuff. So um, this is really great that I found a lot of folks to share information and knowledge with. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. There are actually, I know a couple of other people in Minnesota that you might be able to connect with. One of the things that I would like to encourage people to do is when you do go foraging, that you, that you go with somebody else, um, partly just for practical reasons of safety and stuff, but also because it's so much more fun to ooh and ah with another person. It's like, look what I found. Oh my God, that's so cool. Oh, look what I found. And you know, it just, it is just so much fun when you go with somebody else. I, I, I can't forage anymore. The, the last foraging trip I went on was about five years ago. And it went with Heidi Gustafson and a young student of mine named Madison Hilligloss. And we, we spent all day bent over. <laughs> you know, all you saw of us was our rear ends and just going, oh my God, oh, ah. And it was just the best day ever. Oh, I love that. But you can. Yeah, I uh, I also follow Heidi on Instagram, so I know that she does these um, like trips and she does these uh, different mm -hmm. workshops and things like that, and takes people out. And I am so just dying to somehow at some point join one of those trips as well. Yeah, um, we're going to try and do uh, have different people from around the world, you know, host some kind of a field trip like that where you can get out into the field with somebody, you know, who has experience and can help you. We're also working on doing retreats where uh, some special place in the world where, you know, you can go and you can stay for several days. Um, it's like, I've got a friend in Utah who has, a, you know, a, a cabin where, you know, four or five people could go for a few days and explore the surroundings, gather pigments, and just have, you know, a total pigment immersive kind of retreat. Oh, yes, that would be amazing. So we've, we've got a lot of different things that we're working on putting together, it, but we're so new, we haven't got them all off the ground yet. But it's coming. Yes, well, I'm very excited and thank you for all the resources and the links and things like that that you also post. It's very helpful yeah. and informative and, and I can't thank if, you enough. If you go to, um, Tammy posted the, the link for the Pigment Community Connections, you can go there and there is a category for finding others near where you live. And you can say, hey, you know, I'm in such and such Minnesota, anybody within you know, a, a hundred mile range or whatever. And oh, that we, would be amazing. Yeah, we can start, you know, you can start connecting with other people in your area. Yes, because as, yeah, as I said before, um, as far as I know, I, I even in terms of forging as well, it's kind of far, hard to find some people who want to go forging with me, which is unfortunate, but um, I would be ecstatic to find more people of yeah. the pigment or forging community um, around I where just, I'm at. I've discovered that foraging with non-pigment people is not fun. <laughs> they, it, they tend to say, Are you, don't you have enough of that? Or haven't you already got some of that? Or I'm hungry. I'm bored. I want to go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes. I definitely find other pigment people to go foraging with. Don't take your husband. <laughs> <laughs> noted, noted, thank you. Yeah. 
mine mine drives me nuts we we don't go do things like that anymore because it's do you know how much gas we're spending do you know how hungry i am it's like mm-hmm. I, you know i dealt with that when i was raising kids i don't need it at 65 <laughs> there you go <laughs> well i'm gonna let everybody go i just want to thank you all again and thank tammy for helping me juggle admitting people and hands raised and everything adding to our chat Tammy is part of our board as Catalina is and they are absolutely amazing to work with they bring so much knowledge and this excitement and vibrancy to what we're doing and definitely look up Tammy she has got a, a, just a million year background on pigments. Her expertise is Stone Age, is the Stone Age, caveman style. And she, <laughs> yeah, lives, in, and she lives in an incredible place in the world, South Africa, where she's been to the oldest site where pigments were worked where there was a pigment factory basically so she gets to do really cool stuff and and i was like you were saying when i was there i just wanted to take it all like how much can yeah. i fit in my bag and put in my car i just wanted all <laughs> uh, well, but i was lucky i was there with ochre people so they all understood <laughs> all right with that so i'm going to say oh we, what, what, Tam? No, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's been great. Oh, it's been so amazing to be part of this community. It really is. I, I worked alone for many, many years. And the idea of a community was something that I dreamed of for a long time. And it really came, you know, it, it really started to blossom when I did Pigments Revealed Symposium last year. And this is... This is the natural child of the symposium to keep that community going and growing. So thank you all. I'm going to let you go now. Thank you. Mia. Um, unmute. Amanda, unmute. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was saying that. Hello, hi. <laughs> I had to go and I, I've just come back in uh, just in case anyone was there because I wanted to say hello and thank you because it's been absolutely fascinating. And I, I missed the show and tell, I'll have to watch it on the recording. But um, I've literally just logged back in. But yeah, okay. thank you so much. That's fine. I had brought some pigments, but um, I don't know if you're interested, but it's mussel shell and alabaster. But the light is terrible. It's dark and it's... Um, so the, I'll have to put a photo up. I've done um, oyster shell and clam shell, but I haven't done mussel. Ah. Is mussel, that... It, that's this one here. Oops. What colour are you... Kind of a... It's very pale purple. Okay. Oh. And what I'm interested in, I, I, I did this, but I haven't been able to photograph anything. I tried and I'm not having much luck at the moment, but it's, yeah, this won't show you the color. I'll upload them when I can. Okay. That's probably better, isn't it? But yeah, I would what's like to really know more nice about this. Of, what's really nice about the mussel shell is that it, it gets naturally bleached by the sun mm-hmm. and the sea and the salt in the sea. And in this particular spot on the beach, when the tide goes out, it just leaves, it sort of sifts and all the big mussel shells sits on the surface. And sometimes you get these huge patches of like a cloud of purple, uh-huh. purpley blue. It's a real blue actually on top of the sand. And that's what I was trying to photograph. But I, when I saw it, it happens occasionally and I'm not always there with my camera. But different mussel shell gives different type of pigments. And I love the pale paleness of this. Yeah. Um, 
and I used it in fresco because that's what I first trained in and first arrived at pigments with was the process of, of fresco are you painting. Doing, are you doing plaster yes. work? Yes, I haven't done any for a long time because I have a problem with my back, with my spine, and so I've had to put it on hold. But I did a fresco course about 15 years ago and then one on Roman fresco about one year, uh, one and a half years ago. And it's okay. polishing. So polishing the sand into the lime, polishing a lime plaster when it's still wet. Um, you can use different sands and you can incorporate what aren't traditionally lime compatible pigments, which is what I'm really interested in. So you can do a sort of local fresco, local pigment. Well, oh, that would be fresco. fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm hoping my back will improve enough to do it, just to do some small panels, and then you can do one or two big ones, hopefully, yeah. if a wall came up. <laughs> I need a wall, if anyone's got a wall. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm in Wales. I'm, trying not, I'm not, <laughs> trying not to think about this too hard, because now I want to do it, and I really have to be careful not to get too far outside my own lane. <laughs> But this is, yeah. I try every couple or three years to start learning, learning a new technique or a new medium or something. And it's been a couple of years. So maybe I will have to look at fresco a little bit. That sounds really use, interesting. Do you use gesso at all? Um, I do chalk, sometimes. Gesso? Yeah, I it's do got sometimes. Similar, it depends on what I'm doing. Yeah. It's got similar luminosity, so I think that's what I've fallen in love with, is, is the luminosity of lime and chalk. They refract the light, so the, they kind of yeah. scatter the light through the pigments. And it's, um, yeah, they've got really nice qualities. But I've missed, yeah, so I'm sorry I've missed, but you're recording it, aren't you? So we'd be able to yeah. watch. This will be available for a little while on the website. Um, okay. Well, when I can actually capture the subtlety of the colours with these, which I have got with the alabaster, um, okay. this one's, yeah, I'll, I'll upload them. The, the light's terrible here. Okay. Um, yeah, you can. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, thank you. I think everyone, were you all about to leave? Is that when I logged in? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, I misheard at the beginning. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments or have something they want to share, talk about? Jules? Does Mariello want to go? Um, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, just to say hello from Mexico. I'm also very excited to be part of this community. But unfortun unfortunately, um, I think that I get very late. <laughs> I get a mistake about the change of hour. Mm. Um, I think that I get into this talk like very late. But here I am. Okay. The, it, it'll be, it's recorded. And it'll be available on the website if you want to watch the anything you missed or watch it again. It's yes, I will be like uh, I will see this on on the recorder. Okay, all right. Well, it's good to have you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I I use pigments also like um, as a healing. You know, like I mix the proprieties of plants as as healing also, you know, like here we have uh, herbolaria, I don't know how to say in English, uh, medicine plants. I use medicine plants and also the proprieties of rocks to heal, to heal while painting. That's the huh. thing that I, that I use and that I practice. If I remember right, you use this, use them therapeutically. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I remember reading um, something, I, you know, I remember your name was something about therapeutic use of, of pigments and, and plant 
Yes, in the wild wild pigment, uh, in the wild pigment uh, people. Ah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. In fact, Tilka is coming to visit me in a couple of weeks. Wow. And I, I that's haven't amazing. seen her. I haven't seen her for about two years. Well, I haven't seen her since before COVID. And I'm so excited that she's coming to visit again. I absolutely love having her. And then Heidi yes. Gustafson lives down the hill, just 10 minutes away from me. So yes. I really I, I, I admire like all the network that you have uh, been building because here in Mexico, I think that we have to build that uh, network. Here, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of people working with pigments. And yeah. Some indigenous people as well, but I think that we are missing uh, to connect and have this network. I connect with my students when I dictate workshops, and it's as you say, is the is the time in which I get more excited and I learn more, because yeah. sharing all together and it's a very good time. But then when I I haven't meet I ha we haven't waved a network with all people that are working with natural pigments here in Mexico, but probably we should do it too. Yeah, I end up learning more from my students than I do on my own usually. Just the yeah. questions they ask and they, they help to open my mind to other possibilities and other, other ways of thinking and stuff. And it's always really interesting when you're teaching. Um, I don't know much about the indigenous use of pigments in, in Mexico or South America. I just have a, you know, a very superficial knowledge of it. Um, but it would be interesting to talk more with you and anybody else you know about the traditions uh, you know, that are down there. Yes, yes. Uh... Like, uh, I don't know if, if we have enough time to talk or not in this moment, or probably later we can talk. But yeah, later we could, we could set up a meeting to talk. Yes, I, I, the first time that I learned to use pigments, it was in an indigenous community in Chiapas. Uh, they took me into the woods and we started collecting different things. And it uh -huh. was an amazing experience. And then I start reading a lot of these and going to another workshops and dictating workshops. But I wish that people use use to use the pigments as a ceremonic way. You say like mm -hmm. I don't know if I don't have perfect English. I have to practice. No, no, I understand. But, um, yes, and people used to. To dye, it's the clothes. Mm -hmm. um, when they have like a petition to heal, they dye the clothes with a plant that heal as well. You know, it's like a prayer. Yeah. That's uh, the way of indigenous people use colors at the very beginning, like as a prayer. Um, I That's the information that I get like about uh, living with some indigenous people and also reading. But also nowadays, there's a lot of indigenous people that are, are losing this tradition. Yeah. At, at, at 2019, I went to Michoacán with Purepecha people and they, they didn't dye or use natural pigments yeah. because they forgot so I dictated a, I dictate a worship to them so to remember uh, yeah. to remember all this information because it's in their DNA you know and I think we have that problem all over the world though where indigenous cultures have lost a lot of that kind of knowledge and practice you know due to colonization and and whatever Mm -hmm. All sorts of things can yes. interrupt a, a living tradition like that. And uh, to me here, the work that I'm doing is largely related to cultural revitalization. 
these cultures have lost so much knowledge that they don't know who they are anymore or who they were. And they can't move forward in a healthy and, you know, productive way without knowing who they are and, yes. and how their ancestors did things. So yes. it's, it's really important to, um, to help retain these traditions and, and when they're lost, to seek ways of, of re rebuilding them. Yes. Um, yeah, just to close, like... Uh, in that experience, what I found also is that even though they didn't remember how like to use the pigments and the things related with colors, but they still having a deep connection with nature yeah. and with Mother Earth. So they they uh, teach me mm -hmm. to ask permission before using uh, a rock or an earth or to ask permission before using water and fire and everything so for me it was also like uh i learned a lot <laughs> in it, you, get, you develop a whole relationship not just with your material but the place it comes from you know uh -huh. the, the animals that live there the, the plants that grow there it 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 at least here it is um the, the material and where it comes from and and all of those things are more important than the final product. Yes, than, of course. You know, whatever you produce with it. Yes. And yes. that to me really is, is that's the heart and soul of this. Yes, yes, they keep that heart. Uh, for me, what I was like astonished, you know, like, wow. Yeah. And, and there's uh, other indigenous people that they keep their traditions, mostly in the South, that it's Chiapas and also Oaxaca and Yucatan they keep they keep they still keeping this knowledge but not in the rest of the of mexico yeah experience well thank you thank you for for holding this space and in next one i will i would like to come a time next the um the past year i also arrived late i don't know i probably i have a misunderstanding with the, the time <laughs> it has time. been because our our board is scattered all over the world pri's board of directors is scattered all over the world and it's a nightmare for me to schedule our meetings so that you know it's not the middle of the night for somebody Yes. And I recently discovered, I don't, I don't know why I thought this, but I thought, you know, when we, when we in the U.S. changed to daylight savings time, everybody else in the world who uses daylight savings time, I thought they all did it on the same day. But no, they do it all on different days. So the U.K. Mm -hmm. is different from the U.S. South Africa is different from the U.K. and the U.S. It's just, it's insane. Yeah. So... The time zone problem we've got, I, I need somebody who, who can just manage that because it gives me a headache. I Google it, but I, I think that didn't work my Google, my Google, uh, <laughs> but it's okay. I will see in uh, the recorder. All right. Thank you. Thank you a Thank lot, you. Marilu. Thank you. Jules? Yeah. Hi there. Hi, please. Hi. Um, yeah, I am. Um, Oh yeah, it's kind of not what I want to talk about, but I, I make late pigments out of hedgerows. And then I've been working with the University of Oxford trying to put these pigments into CO2 absorbing paint. It's commercially available. However, mm -hmm. um, I've had the Department of Engineering analyze these paints and they think it's, you know, it could be a real climate solution. Um, but pig, you know, so it's exciting stuff, <laughs> and we're working on it. Yeah, it but sounds like it. It's very like you know that's kind of my the environmental side of my practice, which it is. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do, and it's exciting. But there's also this social side to my practice as well, which I find very interesting because I hear all the pigment people. I hear it all coming about this healing process that you know that is going on with the heat with the pigments which in England in effect 
we kind of don't have that healing process you know we don't have people coming and taking our land you know we yeah. the aggressors as effect you know apart from the vikings you know but it's a little bit too far back and so but what we do have is this power of pigments to have this like social cohesion mm-hmm. like what we have is we are made the beauty of england is that we are multicultural we are made up of all this you know the windrush generation we are made up of all these different people coming to england to make us multicultural that is what is great about us that is the great that is in britain you know and it's you know whether this social cohesion whether this finding about 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 your ancestry through pigments through from where they are and then having this color that is you know this is now oxfordshire for example but it's not made up of the land that we're in now it's made up of the land that we've all come from and that you know it's this it's just a i find it a very useful tool um for cohesion for harmony mm-hmm. you know you know, I find, you know, I can see healing going on around in different states, but, you know, I can feel cohesion that could come from here through different parts of the world. So I think the power of pigments is very special and very deep and very, it's huge. <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree with you that there is a, what I'm finding with other pigment people is a kinship. Yeah, that I feel more kinship with you than I do with some of my own family members. Yeah, you know, um, and there there is a cohesion, mm. it, it, but it's coming from so many different paths, so many different disciplines, yeah. and everybody's coming together. And this is the thing that I've said for many years: is that pigments are. The, the, a pivot point mm. all of these other things that that go out in the world mm. we can we can look at pretty much any discipline through the lens of pigments in fact i'm yeah. working with a couple of professors to develop a model educational program for college and universities i love that, that about the Kenielsen physics and chemistry for artists love yeah that, that would be a, a that would be amazing to have uh, but we're we're developing a, a model program where you can be in the chemistry department or physics or history or geology or whatever, but you're looking at that subject through the lens of pigments. Yeah. And then at the end of the semester, everybody will come together as mm. a conference and yeah. and share what they've learned yeah and we want to develop that as a model for colleges and universities around the world yeah it's a it's a kind of the definition of interdisciplinary isn't it it's like exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah pigments are so interdisciplinary and it just i i've been doing this for many many years but i'm always amazed when i learn of a new a new aspect to them it's i I think it's endless the only one i haven't figured out how it fits in yet is math (laughs) but but somebody Uh, else can deal with that yeah (laughs) yeah no but thank you yeah oh you're welcome for um it's good to have a place where you know you've got people who, who you, you can ask <laughs> yeah you yeah. can ask and you can share with yeah absolutely um unmute 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 amanda you guys can all unmute if you want and just yes no, i've done it done it done. Um, just have a conversation about the maths um when you've got all the pigments have different weights and they have different yeah you can if you crush them and they cover a surface area you can do surface area and maths with pigments because you they'll all cover a different surface area according to their weight oh, which is quite nice Does well, that and, your brain? And, and it comes in in the physics and chemistry part of it too 
yeah. yeah when I do analysis, well. when I do analysis on pigments, I'm looking at atomic weights. Um, like if I have a pigment from an object, a sample from an object and a sample from a deposit, I can match them pretty, pretty identically, exactly by looking at atomic weights of all the different elements that are present. And I guess that's mm. part of mathematics, I guess. Mm. Yeah. It is. Yeah, all of those measurements, ratios, weights, but I was thinking also when you paint with a pigment, you're transferring something that's volume to surface area. Mm -hmm. And so that's maths, isn't it? That's I think that's because isn't that um geometry? Physics. Geometry yeah. as well. And that's geometry, true. probably. Yeah. So yeah, we nice. don't think about oh, yeah. we don't think I, about I, these things in that way. And if if my math teachers in school had taught me math using art yeah it would have i might have gotten it yeah it'd be amazing. as it is i'm i'm basically a mathematical moron <laughs> well I, uh, i'm trying to yeah i'm doing a bit of maths at the moment with working with ellipses because i think the <laughs> the the way an ellipse works spatially yeah but to draw an ellipse you have to measure it and do the geometry but the numbers have this relational, the way the circle splits. So then you can create these lines that have different measurements, which I want to try and equate to the tide lines because I've always lived by the sea. I don't know yet, it's, it's early days, but it's, it's in progress. So if I get anywhere with it and with the maths, because I want to try and get some help with the maths, I'll let you know. Okay, good, <laughs> okay. thank you. I think it's an interesting <laughs> correlation with the tides. Mm. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? No. Just, just when you talk about math, I thought that probably when you use the pig the pigment to paint and you make a formula, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if you make like you make like a main formula, and yeah. then if you want to make little experiments you have to make the equivalent between one formula to a, uh, I can say like a, to a, not, to, a, um, to a smaller just, unit. Yeah, just a small parts of pigment, like just to experiment in different ways. And then you can make their like, to say percentages, you say yeah. or not? Very yes. Uh -huh. And make equivalents, that's math. Because I, I, I get, <laughs> I get like very, like I used to make that kind of mathematics thing. Ah, see, I never even thought about that because I do when I when I make paint for other people, I have to use I call it a recipe, but I, I guess it's a formula too. I use a recipe and I, I have to weigh everything or or measure it exactly. I tend to weigh things. And okay. I guess that is a form of math. So Okay, I, I am starting to see how it fits into what we do. And I really, I really appreciate having that perspective. It felt funny to me to have, you know, such a such a big discipline that I could that I couldn't connect to pigments. But you guys are really helping me see how that works together. So I will add this to our list of things to talk about while we're working on this model program. That we can include mathematics. The math yeah. department isn't going to escape us. No. You there, Mia? I, I think Mia's gone. The other Sometimes people leave and they forget to close uh, out. Oh, yeah. I better go anyway. Right, thank yeah. you very much for everything. Oh, you're, oh, you're very welcome. Thank yeah. you for thank you for being here. Yeah. I, I really like these little after sessions, you know, with just a handful of people, you know, <laughs> talking about stuff. It's always very informative and, and interesting to me and to get to meet people 
to meet you guys a little bit better. You know, I know you all on paper, but Sometimes it's easier to talk to eight people than it is 48 people. Isn't oh, it? yeah. <laughs> I, I am much better one on one than I am in, in big groups. I'm, I'm not a public person. So this is really stretching my not my comfort, but just, I guess, what I'm good at. It's, yeah. it's Tammy is so much better at this than I am. I, if I could have her be our, you know, our, our speaker, our host for everything, I would. Yeah. But it's really been lovely getting to meet you, you know, much better, you know. Yeah. Now I have faces to put with names and I, I know something about you. So take care. We'll see you. All Bye. right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. And I want to say, Melanie, you just said that it wasn't what you felt so comfortable doing, but you've been absolutely brilliant. And in your symposium last year, you were introducing everybody and it was just fantastic. Oh. My sound went last year and I couldn't sort of chat to anybody, but um, technical issues, but I could hear everything. <laughs> it was oh, really well, good. that's good. I'm yeah. glad. So thank you. It's it's given me, I think um, I've always been in Wales and sort of doing this quite on my own in a way with pigments and just got into them naturally. But it's just so inspiring and insightful and all the different disciplines that you've had people speaking about. So thank you. Thank well, you much. I want to bring a lot more of this. And like I said, we're going to be doing things every month. And if you have ideas for things, let me know. You know, if there's okay. something that piques your interest, if you have questions about a particular subject or whatever. Okay. Um, okay. We've got about 600 people on the mailing list now. And, you know, as we go on, the, the community connection will start to grow the, the forum where everybody can ask questions and connect. That will grow too. So feel free to post questions, ask, you know, and, and contact us if you have ideas. Okay, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. All right. It was I'll lovely. <laughs> meet, it was really lovely meeting both of you. Thank you. You too. Thanks very much. Okay. All right. Bye. Oh, she's not there.